today I went out and I finished the Sylvanas novel. I started reading it uh, the day before yesterday and I, I, I plowed through it, not just because I felt like I had to, but because I genuinely loved it. I don't know how long it took me. I didn't time it, but it was time well spent. And you know me, fan, I'm not a huge fan of franchise novels anyway really i like christy golden uh i think she does a good job but franchise novels i always find a little bit awkward you start a franchise novel and it's always like darth vader took off his shiny black helmet and put it down on the table he was so upset with how the force was so dark and stuff like that you know and, and it's like that with Warcraft novels as well. It's like Thrall sat down with his chunky frame and laid the doom hammer down by the side of his crown. It had been passed down by the, and you're like, oh yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. And it always just seems like incredibly awkward to me. So however good the writers are, I always find it traditionally quite hard to get into franchise novels. There's uh, a, a few topics. I've, I've tried to kind of organize this into uh, like some kind of, help for myself really to try and organize it um and and try and uh, go through it and and organize my thoughts on it a little bit so we can discuss it properly um i have it has to be said enjoyed uh the novels more since war crimes i found that from before the storm uh through uh shadows rising and now sylvanus honestly I think they've kind of almost transcended franchise novels and entered some like genuinely good territory. And I I think, I always said Before the Storm was my favorite Warcraft novel, but genuinely I, I, I think that Sylvanas might be the best of the bunch. Now, I have just finished reading it. So I've got that like just finished reading a book glow. And you know, when you just finished reading a book, like it's kind of like all you can think about. And you often think that a book you've just finished is one of the best books you've ever written. Like, so, you know, I, I, I'd be very wary of that. But at the moment, I genuinely feel like it's top, top draw. And there's a lot of things I like about it. And, uh, you know, we are going to get into specifics and details. And I'm happy to answer any questions as well that you have on it. And bear, bear in mind, I've only read through it once. And I read through it without taking notes. So there might be some things that I've misremembered or that I don't remember or that I forget to mention and things like that. This is very much kind of like a an off-the-cuff kind of reaction rather than an in... Like, if I was going to review it, I'd read it again. There's lots which is very, very interesting about it. So... Um, you can see from my little headlines I've got up here, the Sylvanas novel, I just want to give like a, uh, a general kind of reaction to it. And this novel is really kind of s split into three parts. All of it is set against the holding form of uh, Sylvanas in the cinematics with uh, Anduin, where she is trying to get him to join the Jailer's side because, you know, she believes in the mission statement and she wants... Anduin on side for whatever reason it's something we've discussed like a lot on this stream before and she's telling him like the history of her life basically that's like the holding form as you put it you know so it's implied that not everything we read in the book is told to Anduin but that's her remembering of it and of course it's her remembering of it so everything is from her point of view it's her memory we don't see anything that sylvanus wouldn't see you know so there's no scenes basically without sylvanus in the entire book you know it's not like um someone else pe people having discussion that she would never have been privy to or anything like that so it's very much from the point of view of sylvanus and in that case there is obviously a discussion to be had about unreliable narrator as well which I, I i feel like there are a couple of instances in the book where you could you could put that down so the first section of the book is very much her talking about her childhood and growing up and everything leading up to her death at the hands of Arthas. And I would very much like put that as the first part of the book. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in its own section. And then retcons. And when I say retcons, that's a bit of a, a sensationalist title, I guess, because there are, for many people, the reason this book is interesting is they don't really give a shit about Sylvanas's past or her growing up or whatever. It's a nice part of the book. It takes up like a majority of the book, honestly. What they are interested in is 
reading about how her character has been since meeting the jailer and how all of these things fit together. And I think that's, you know, one of the things, certainly on the uh, in the online discourse about the book, that's one of the most important parts of it. So we'll be going through those as well, and I'll be bringing up kind of every instance I can think of that is relevant to, you know, w- what does it tell us about Savannah's story and, and leading up to Shadowlands and the things that have happened in Shadowlands and, you know, from meeting the jailer onwards? Like, how does it recontextualize things, uh, if anything? Like, what does it tell us that we didn't know, basically, about the story of Shadowlands and her relationship with the jailer and things like that? And uh, obviously there will be spoilers in that bit. And we're going to look at some kind of uh, reactions to it as well and some some talking points that people have brought up online that I'll have my, uh, my kind of two cents on as well. And then we're going to talk about the ending, which uh, is pretty interesting. Uh, just from a kind of a, a character and storyline point of view. It's very, very obvious as well, by the way, why they wanted this book to come out on the same day that the Judgment chapter did, in-game. Like, very, very obvious. And what that tells us is that 9.2, at some point, was definitely scheduled to be released in November last year. Like, that's what that tells us. Because that was when the release date for this book originally was. I can imagine they... And that's when they thought they would be releasing 9.2 in November last year, right? Because that's when they gave the date for the novel. You know, at some point, they were literally kicking around a genuine date for 9.2 as being November last year. No, sorry. 9.2 wouldn't have dropped in November. The Judgment chapter would have dropped in November. That means 9.2 would originally have been planned to drop in September. Uh, so yeah, we are going to talk spoilers of it. Like, it's impossible, right? It's impossible to give a spoiler-free review of this book, especially when so much of like the interest around it is very specifically big events that have happened in-game, and hopefully, you know, for some people, explaining a lot of the, the, the big in- in-game events. So my spoiler-free review of the book, before we get started properly on like the minutiae of it, Christy Golden is really, really good at taking history of WoW, so a story that is already there, the bones of it that have either been told in game or in in some other way, and fleshing those out into realistic moments. Not even spicing it up, just making it tasty and more and nutritious and wholesome. Like taking kind of events that we've heard of and that we know of, maybe they've happened in game, maybe they've just been like, you know, referred to in game, maybe it's just like history of the game that was written by someone else. She's very good at taking those and really making them kind of very character based and that's absolutely what happens in the first part of this book with uh, Sylvanas's history and and childhood growing up which I think is probably the best part of the book from just kind of a novel point of view is this incredible kind of like old school not just wow but like fantasy experience as well because it's so kind of like chill and slow paced and and really focusing on like the Windrunner girls and the birth of uh, Lyra the, uh, uh, the the brother who gets so much attention in this book and gets so much focus and kind of, you know, filling out and stuff like that. So, like, for the first kind of third of the book, really, maybe even half of the book, it does feel like pleasingly old school where you've basically gone here is sylvanas windrunner you know her you like her you've seen her in warcraft right and it tells the story of them growing up and kind of uh sylvanas kind of going through the trial with Alaria for her to kind of start her ranger general training and kind of helping out and just a nice character piece on the three sisters and the brother and the parents as well which is like super interesting and of course yeah yeah uh, um uh paddy matson um narrates the book as well which must be awesome and that's really cool because you're just existing in pre warcraft one world for a little bit and then you just hear kind of like rumblings of you know the dark portal opening and and kind of like green monsters coming through and you know it it speeds through the years but there is a nice kind of sitting on each year and and enjoying just the world and the environment and there's a big focus on environment as well particularly in those growing up chapters you know all of the sisters are are hunters and you know they they live in the wild that's that's part of their kind of natural habitat 
that. And Sylvanas in particular has like an aversion to uh, the town and like the kind of the fripperies of, of, of high elf society and stuff, right? And so really does kind of focus on her relationship to nature and the colours and the smells. They've got like this uh, kind of special place where they, they like to go, which is kind of, you know, you know like a, a, a trope. The family, you know, the kids of the family and, and, and the uh, the parents are like, yeah, we've got this special place that we like to go to down by the river. And it's really nice because they go there a few times um, during those opening chapters and it's always at a different time of day. So kind of like subconsciously, you're taking in like the passing of time and, you know, the way that time affects nature and the way that nature changes with different seasons and at different times of the day and like the different kind of sensations and smells and, and, and kind of sights and sounds that come with that. And those sensations are really enjoyed in, in the text because, of course, later on, when she becomes undead and she becomes the Banshee and stuff, all of that sensation and and kind of joy and experience of touch and feeling and and like the sensation of smell and uh, and of just nature doing its thing is completely taken away because not only is she now undead uh, and a banshee but also all of those uh, forests and, and and land is kind of scoured and you know putrid and dying and and it's a very it's all dark and the colours are kind of like fading and what have you a lot of focus on what has been taken away because part of this is showing us why Sylvanas ends up doing in BFA and Shadowlands in particular what she does and uh, a lot of the kind of the explanation for what she ends up doing is placed on this idea of loss which is why she feels like everything's so unfair, right? And and that's one of the uh, overall feelings. And it's good that it's kind of laid on so thick at the beginning. You know, what I really appreciated was there wasn't anything kind of, apart from the setting, like the family dyna dynamic was not portrayed as being idyllic at all. You know, because that would be a very easy kind of trick to fall into. All the sisters getting on really well and, uh, you know, all having like uh, unconditional love from their parents and having like an amazing life and then it gets taken away. And something that really impressed me was that they didn't fall into that and that, you know, the dynamics of the family are very recognisable and like troubled in many ways and, you know, the, the pressures and expectations that are put on, on different kids and the mother is portrayed as uh, particularly to the other daughters as being like incredibly domineering and you know setting incredibly high standards for her kids because she's the ranger general right it makes sense um and she she has to push them hard partly to make sure they're worthy of the positions that they are going to inherit and partly because so she's not being shown to have sort of favoritism and stuff and the dad is very much more a more kind of measured figure uh he's important in his own right in the court and stuff and they he usually he has like a, a more passive but also more friendly relationship with them but then the relationships between the kids are shown as being quite fraught at times because they're kids growing up together right and there's a lot of pressure under them and Lirath the brother is portrayed as being kind of like the antithesis to the girls in that he's quite slight and he's quite weak relatively and he's uh, artistic and musical and isn't being therefore kind of groomed as a ranger in any way like he's not being trained in combat he shows you know like incredible skill in music and the arts um, and that's what it's focused on with him and his upbringing which he feels really bad about and and kind of useless about because obviously the work that his sisters and his parents do are incredibly important to like the safety of the kingdom and he's just like a singer and he doesn't really appreciate like how important that is to the family and how like how much they need him to not be <laughs> a warrior like them because he's kind of a symbol of everything that they are trying to protect and like the reason they do their work so it's really cool and like even though the setting of you know what becomes the the, the ghost lands and stuff is portrayed as being very idyllic it's all forests and and beauty and and you know flowing water and and nature and wildlife and living within that so i i thought that was really interesting and i loved those uh that opening third maybe even half of the book where we just exist in that time and we're seeing them as kids and we're seeing them grow up and we're seeing like the, the difficulties and things that they're going through and of course uh, the importance of all of that to Sylvanas because it's meant to it's meant to give you a real impression of what she's lost when it's all gone and there is even then a sense of kind of like unfairness about a lot of things she has no desire to be the ranger general but when Aleria turns it down you know she gets this responsibility kind of thrust on her that she wasn't expecting much like her own Dean 
dear Queen Elizabeth II, I guess. Um, and and you know, so she doesn't get to choose what she becomes in that sense. Kind of a lack of freedom of will, right? And there's a sense that she she doesn't get to choose a lot of what happens to her, even as a child, which she has some very clear resentments about. Um, also in those opening chapters, of course, you get introduced to Nathanos. Now, I can't be alone in not rating Nathanos as one of my all-time favorite World of Warcraft characters, mostly because I can't really get over his betray uh, portrayal in BFA and Legion and the, the, the decision, the one decision that the voice actor makes to basically make him sound like a Disney villain. I always think he should maybe just be called like Wanathanos. <laughs> I kind of like the writing of him in game and what the writing, whenever I read one of his text boxes, I'm like, oh, that's, that's fun. That's good. I like that. But then you remember his voice and it's like, oh, hello, champion. I think you're terrible and I'm going to be rude to you. Which, but of course in the book, he's portrayed much more as what he's supposed to be. Like, he's much more like the hound, right? He's like a rough farmer who is ugly and who, you know, doesn't have like that kind of sneer to him. He's sarcastic, but in a very blunt way. I feel like in game, he's portrayed as being very sneering. And I don't think that's what Nathan is at all and I think the book gets it absolutely right he's just like this yeah he's a cackler in game he wouldn't cackle in the book and uh, there's this there's this thing where he's you know he is just incredibly blunt tells it how it is and the scenes with him and Sylvanas particularly when he first turns up are awesome like so good and I'm I'm completely sold on the Thanos now and it's one of the very few kind of characters that we know love each other meet each other and there's a spark sort of thing one of the very few times I've ever really bought that in a book like this but I completely believed it I absolutely believed it I thought it was so beautifully done and it's exactly the kind of thing that I, I think Christy Golden is amazing at so she's the obvious choice for this book in that sense so we follow them through all of these kind of trials and tribulations up into the point where and there are going to start to story spoilers here and it all starts getting very very serious when her parents <coughs> die and her parents are murdered uh, on their way to Lordaeron um, to discuss the Horde who are a new thing like the Horde are a new thing we're in kind of like Warcraft 2 territory now I'm choking on a crouton but I am also very emotional um, and they, they get murdered uh, and uh, and so Sylvanas instantly becomes Ranger General with Lothamar as her kind of like sidekick and um they perform an investigation and they realize that you know it's not just the trolls oh one thing i'll say about the trolls and and to a certain degree the orcs as well because you know the trolls are set up quite reasonably as the main antagonists of this opening part of the book you know they go out and on patrol and stuff and they they find you know rangers who have been murdered by troll kind of hunting parties and things like that because you know that's that's what life is like there at the time and i get that we are seeing it from Sylvanas's point of view so you know the way that she sees the trolls is is very important and that's how we see the trolls because it's how she sees them I get that but remember I said it was like a very old school kind of representation of World of Warcraft or, or just like the, the Warcraft of Azeroth I guess unfortunately that old schoolness does kind of seep through into early descriptions of the trolls as well and you know they're the Amani trolls so they're bad trolls right and we know there are good trolls as well but you know they're, they're very specifically Amani trolls so they're very like violent they are portrayed in book as being very beast-like and very monstrous and it you know we've had conversations about this so much on stream in the last year or so and and how kind of you know these tropes are used and how helpful they are and things like that but they're shown as being very savage right and and kind of uncivilized and basic and very animal-like um and you know voodoo-y and screeching and cackling and screaming and, and just, yeah, zinger right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Partly because of the old school feel of the book, that does fit, but it's also, I don't know, man, it's a bit icky. Yeah, especially when you consider, like, you know, the High Elves are basically imperialists and, and you know... <laughs> but I get that we are seeing it through specifically Sylvanas' eyes. So, you know, the descriptions that we are having of the trolls very much represent her opinion of them in that sense, right? So I get it. So anyway, the Amani have teamed up in the Horde 
and uh, you know they discover that that uh, even though they've tried to hide it orcs were involved with this attack on their parents and, and murdering their parents as well and it's all very brutal it's all quite graphic and so Savannah is, is is in this position where she's like the horde are going to attack they are you know a major danger she goes to uh, King Asterion who is like you cannot tell anyone this you know we are locked away in our kingdom here we got the sun well no one can hurt us your job is to make sure no one else is scared and they can just go on living their lives you know we're perfectly safe here you can keep out any threat whether it be troll or horde we don't need to spread panic and tell people it's all very fucking jaws right and you know they don't think this is right alaria comes back for the for the funeral of uh well not the funeral she comes back for the uh the the kind of uh, ceremony that makes sylvanas ranger general um but at this point all the characters are, are just so well drawn and so brilliant and i was just having such an absolute ball reading this novel at this time it's a it's a genuine cracking read even before you get into any of the uh, like the the stuff that we know Sylvanas for really, um, and and even, especially before we get into any of the the like Shadowlands stuff, which I know is the main interest for a lot of people, particularly people who won't read the book. I think like ninety percent of people, and this is perfectly fair, right? This is perfectly reasonable. This is just how kind of media works in in fantasy and and franchises and fandoms and things. Ninety percent of people who will end up having a, an opinion about this book won't read the book, and they will experience it through people like me talking about it people like Bellila talking about it people having hot takes and sharing bits on twitter and things like that and that's not ideal obviously but it's it, it, it's understandable there's loads of uh, warcraft books that i haven't read but that i can tell you what they're about and whether people like them or not and I, some some famous bits from them and stuff like that most of you in the chat now probably won't read this book that's why you're listening to me talk about it right <laughs> so that you don't have to and that's obviously not ideal but i'm also aware that i've got kind of like a responsibility to give you a fair impression of this book and not just focus on the bits that are easy to kind of like criticize and give you more of an impression of because there are those bits and we'll get to them um and more just give you an impression of, of this book as a whole and generally like that opening half of the book where it is her history is like just genuine joy and like rollicking awesome fun and just a, a really nice world to exist in honestly so much is made of Lirath and how she important he is especially to Sylvanas that knowing where uh, Shadowlands goes and and the kind of turn that Sylvanas takes which obviously we all do reading the book it's impossible not to see very early on what they're doing with the character of Lirath who is someone that's never had anything before you know, I think wasn't uh, wasn't the comic, the Three Sisters comic, literally the first time he'd ever even featured in anything. He was just like mentioned in lore, but he was never in like, a story or a book or anything. And then I think there was like a picture of him in the Three Sisters book. Uh, and that was like the first time he'd ever been in anything at all. So like he is he is a, a blank slate and they use him as that. They they make him exactly what they need to he needs to be to service this particular story, right? Um because he is portrayed, yeah, her little lord's son is portrayed incredibly early, like from the second he's born as being like the most important thing in Sylvanas's life and the the thing that she loves the most and that she values the most and that she wants to protect more than anything else. And you know, he's golden-haired he's innocent he's different from the, the the kind of like the fighting people around him and you know he's very eloquent and he's young and he's innocent and he's called little lord's son and it, you spot very early they are setting it up for anduin to kind of be a surrogate for lirath in sylvanas's eyes later on which is something they never really push very hard but it's definitely something that's there it's much more important as a representation of what sylvanas loses because losing him is something that very much haunts her when the hordes start attacking in what would be warcraft 2 and dragon riders and shit start attacking the the forests and stuff that's when the horde wipe out everyone at windrunner spire and in the village including lirath because lirath is is a uh a, a palace musician a royal musician at that time but he when his parents are killed he begs sylvanas to teach him how to fight and she refuses because she's like no it's really important that you're artistic and that you make songs for people and inspire them and like what's the it's like that churchill line right when uh in, in world war ii i think this is meant to be like a myth but uh in world war ii you know someone asked churchill he's like well i guess like after
after the war when we're rebuilding and stuff you'll have to you know you have to cut funding to the arts and stuff right and Churchill apparently said well if we do that what are we even fighting for I think that's not actually true and it, it was not, never a conversation that happened but it's like a really nice sentiment which is why it gets shared so much and it's it's very much like that with with Sylvanus it's like you know he represents everything that she is fighting to protect so the idea of him becoming a uh a, a, a warrior is is anathema to her, right? It transpires when she gets to Windrun Aspire after the attack and everyone has been killed. Obviously, she finds Lirath's body and he's like decked out in leather armor, uh, archery armor and stuff because it turns out that um, Var- Varisa has been training him like secretly, which is what causes the huge rift between Sylvanas and, and Varisa because Sylvanas obviously blames Varisa for putting him in harm's way. He wasn't prepared to be in that fight but it gave him a, a reason to be there. The fact that he was being trained, trying to defend his home and stuff like that. And obviously that death in particular is like incredibly impactful on Sylvanas and really kind of changes her outlook on things and hardens her in a way that she hasn't been before. Her parents are dead. She's the Ranger General. Um, she uh, is in like the biggest fight of her life. alaria has been missing for years. Varisa, she's just had this huge like life-defining kind of split up with, right? Um, and and this is like the first kind of major turning point for her in her life, where she's she she is struck by how unfair everything is, which is like obviously quite important in her journey. It's been made. I remember. I remember one of the things that got shared a lot at this stage um was before the book came out one of the holding form interludes was shared by blizz which is you know sylvanas is telling him her story and anduin's like you had a great life what are you talking about yeah your mum it might have been hard on you but at least you had a (laughs) mum you know at least you had a relationship with your family and you grew up and then you went through some hard stuff yeah sure but you know and a lot was made online of how what's Anduin doing there he's just a privileged kid right and oh yeah you're right Anduin it must have been so hard being Prince of Stormwind and there's a lot of criticism about that segment which is baffling to me frankly <laughs> like that little interlude is set after she's just been telling him about how great her life was so yeah obviously he thinks she had a great life and also like is in the context of him obviously being a prisoner talking for his life right uh it's it, it, very strange the kind of criticism that 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 little the interlude bit got online when it was uh, first released and kind of you know indicative of a lot of the waiting in the wings criticism that was just there ready to pounce that has been surrounding this book for a long while. I think they made a mistake publishing that interlude. Is it that context? Uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah, they absolutely overestimated the community. (laughs) But honestly, I think if this has proven anything, if I think if this entire experience of the Shadowlands story, and particularly Sylvanas' arc in the Shadowlands story, I think if that proves anything, it's that you can't underestimate the WoW community and the things that they will misunderstand. Like, when you have a cinematic where Sylvanas literally says the words, I must face the consequences, and half the fucking community online turns around and is like, oh my god, they're saying that Sylvanas isn't going to have to face the consequences. When that's the level that you're working at, honestly, what are Blizz supposed to do? Is that 50% of the community or just loud folks? Okay, fine. That's a very good point, Evergrown. That's a very, very good point, and it's well made. But, okay, 50% of the community that I come into contact with then, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 it's an important clarification for sure. If the good guy doesn't have a white hat and the bad guy a blue hat. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If they want us to know who the bad guy is, give them a red lightsaber, you know? It's easy. <laughs> One of the things about this book is it's trying to show you Sylvanas' journey and why she ends up uh, doing what she's doing. And to get her there, they have to get to her to a point of, you know, not hopelessness, but, you know, everything that was good has been taken away in very unfair terms. Like, that's quite important to her motivations and to her state of mind and to why she ends up doing what she does, right? So, naturally... As a consequence, a lot of this book is like unrelentingly sad. After the initial set, and even a lot of stuff in the initial setup is very sad, but there comes a point where it's just like 
unrelenting. And and uh, the first time it gets like that is during the Warcraft 2 stuff where her whole family and homestead is wiped out, right? And then we start getting into like more recognizable territory of Warcraft 3, which is where for many people it's going to start getting juicy because now we're into this book filling in gaps of a story that we have seen portrayed in game. Like once we're in Warcraft 3, everything that happens to Sylvanas is something we have seen in game and it's seeing how this book recontextualizes that or tell what what the book tells us about that that we maybe didn't know already. And also it's where I don't think the book ever reaches the heights of the the kind of the, the family background stuff ever again because it becomes a very different type of book. It is kind of technically a bit shallower because what it's doing is it has to zoom through so many big events, you know, and it, it, it has to really kind of pick its battles and it has to really choose the bits that it's going to kind of focus on and give a bit more depth and a bit more texture because obviously it's not chronicle. It can't do all of it. So it has to like, it has to, ve it has to be very selective in the, not the bits that it mentions because fuck, it pretty much mentions everything, right? But the bits that it kind of settles on and goes into a bit more detail about and finds a bit more texture in, those are the bits that it has to kind of like pick and choose its battles a little bit and and it, it, it's kind of breakneck honestly for the next third of the book so you know there's a lot of focus on arthas and arthas turning here into uh, a, a banshee and there's a lot of kind of focus on her time as a banshee that fits in really well with the, the whole like point of the story right and the whole the whole theme of the story because it's a time where she literally had no control so there are a few themes going through this book right one is family Obviously, it's kind of like about family, really. And uh, Sylvanas, you know, one is loss, very clearly. And one is like unfairness and, and you know, injustice, which is something that Sylvanas feels incredibly keenly throughout a lot of her life. There's no better example of that, really, than when she's a banshee at the hands of Arthas. Like the chapter where she, as a banshee, just fucking kills everyone in Silvermoon is awesome <laughs> like so good uh, and like all the stuff of her as a banshee is, is is fantastic and like regaining control of herself and setting up the forsaken and her relationship with the forsaken and it's very much played her relationship with the forsaken which i guess we can kind of move on to our retcons section now like stuff in the book that maybe changes the way you think about some things or tells us stuff that we didn't know so we're on to the bits that people will be talking about on twitter now these are the bits that people will take screenshots of and they'll tweet about or they'll make YouTube videos about and they will talk about because these are from, from a kind of like a cataloging the law point of view. These are kind of like the important bits and, uh, you know, the most interesting bits to a lot of like WoW players. Understandably, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, some dude on Twitter has been having a lot of dudes on Twitter have been having a field day. Um with uh the lava eels so we'll talk about the lava eels and it was one of those takes that i saw obviously before i read the book because it came out a, a few days before the book was officially released anywhere some people just got their copies earlier we're 100 percent going to talk about it don't worry um so like and i think the lava eels is a really good example of that because i saw that take and i saw like a little bit of some of the text that someone had shared and even not having read the book i was like there is more to that take. There is more to that segment. And even though I haven't read the book, I've got a very, very sneaky suspicion, a not so sneaky suspicion, that this little passage might be being a tad misrepresented here. And I can say, having read the book, that in my humble opinion, I was right. That's why, you know, it's good that we've had a whole day's break before we get to this bit. Talked about like the general story of the book up to the moment that she meets the jailer and this is where it stops being like just a novel that is enjoyable to fans of warcraft and it starts being relevant to the current game and the current story and the current discourse around the game right because people's problems with the story are oft repeated and well known and broad and varied and there is no way uh, since a lot of the problems people have are specifically to do with the jailer and sylvanas and that whole situation through the course of bfa and shadowlands there's no way that this book can't possibly touch on that i saw like an advert like a little trailer 
from Blizzard about this book yesterday on Twitter, which was like, do you know the whole story? This book will tell you, right? Which I don't think is very good advertising. I mean, it is for people buying the book, but I don't think it's very healthy uh, because, yeah, a, a lot of people, one of the big complaints people have is that, you know, the story should be told in game and you should be able to play the game and understand the story without having to read tertiary media. Something which I agree with, a statement which I absolutely agree with. Um, and I was interested to see when I picked up this book what effect it would have on how I viewed the story of Shadowlands, what it would change about what I thought I knew about the story of Shadowlands, and what it would tell me that I just didn't know. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. Um, and I, I think, you know, from the moment that she goes to uh, Ice Crown. So, you know, the current law before this book is that she went to Ice Crown and uh, in the Edge of Night short story, uh, Cataclysm had technically started. Deathwing was out and flying about by now. Um, but then a short story came out where she went to Ice Crown and, you know, she was like, oh, Arthas is dead. I've got nothing else to live for. Um, and she threw herself from Ice Crown onto the Saranite below and saw darkness and nothing and suffering and realized that that's what was waiting for her uh, should she, you know, continue to go. And also the Valkyrie were there, um, or the Valkyrie were there, <laughs> who gave her visions of the uh, Forsaken being, like, destroyed, wiped out in war because they were you being used by the Horde as just, like, expendable, like, cannon fodder, right? And she was like, I need to stop this as well. So she made a deal with the Valkyrie, uh, uh, where she came back and, you know, they kept her alive and gave her the ability to raise more Forsaken and started the new era in Sylvanas. We have known since Shadowlands that that was the moment where she also met the Jailer that has been told to us so even though that bit has never been in in the game we knew it because it was told to us now it could be argued that the whole edge of night thing was never in the game either <laughs> so you know wow has got a habit of kind of sharing important story moments outside of the game something which i think most of us would say we're not fans of right is that is that fair uh, adam k i'm so sorry i missed what you said before we get into jailer stuff can we take a real quick uh talk real quick about how nathanos knew about night elves and the well of eternity when he met sylvanas before the events of World, uh, warcraft one okay so we were talking a little bit about yeah sure i think that's fine we were talking a little bit about um nathanos yesterday and how he's one of the best things in the entire book frankly and his character comes across quite differently to how it does in game and i think better and and just works better and the relationship between Nathanos and Sylvanas is one of the genuine high points of the novel for me like it's it's playful without being kind of book playful does you know you're on dangerous territory when you've got people like flirting in a book right yeah and I think I, Shadow, Shadows Rising does it really well as well but it's at a different stage of their relationship there as well um, but I, I, I'd agree with that and uh, there is a moment where uh, so when Nathanos turns up he turns up and he saves uh, Lothamar from uh, you know a, a troll attack Lothamar and Sylvanas are fighting for their lives in a troll ambush and he happens to be there because he's spying basically and uh, he down a few trolls including one that was going to kill Lothama and uh, you know he's got important information to share with uh, King Anasterion and uh, Sylvanas takes him to him and in the course of that he impresses Sylvanas with uh, among other things his shooting his blunt kind of demeanor but also his knowledge of Silvermoon and the Sunwell and this is something that I had to be reminded by uh, reminded of is that technically Officially, it would have been very, very hard for Nathan Nathanos to have known any of this about the Sunwell specifically, because later on in the game, you know, it's still something which is very vague and that people outside of uh, the city don't know about you know, let alone humans and things like that. And yet uh, Nathanos seems to have an incredible relative, incredible like knowledge of the Sunwell and its workings. Now he is a spy and it's like his job to know, but yeah, you could, you could, you could, you could call that a retcon, I suppose. The fact that maybe the uh, Sunwell was slightly better known 
than uh, it has previously been betrayed in lore outside of Silvermoon. He could have learned it by talking to a high elf, exactly. But then, and the thing is, you could make the argument, well, he's a spy, right? So if he had learned this stuff, then the humans would know it as well because he'd have shared this information. But he never really goes back to being a human in the Alliance. Like, from the time he gets introduced into the story, he basically stays at Sylvanas' side forever after that until he, like, dies, right? Until, like, big wars are happening where that information wouldn't even be useful. So it's, 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 it's I guess it's feasible that he had recently learned it on his, like, forays into, uh, like, uh, the North and literally had never had a chance to share this information by going back home because he never does. <laughs> you know uh, and there's also this thing there's something we've talked about on the stream before this idea that you know thousands of years is a really fucking long time like how long has the sun well been active at this point like six thousand years seven thousand years like how long did it take after the sundering for the the high elves to find their way to the eastern kingdoms and settle whatever the exact length of time is they've been there for thousands they've been there for over two thousand years and when you consider that two thousand years is like literally the difference between us and jesus it seems like a difficult thing to keep a secret and i know like they're a they're a, a secretive race who keep themselves to themselves and kind of everyone does and also there's no telephones but there are portals <laughs> And they did teach humans how to do magic, right? A couple of thousand years ago, they taught humans how to do magic. And the Sunwell would have probably been involved in that in some way, since it's where High Elves get their magic from, right? And get their power from. So it's kind of impossible to imagine that some of the people that were specifically taught magic by the High Elves, of which there were many, hadn't heard about the Sunwell at some point, right? Or put two and two together themselves. So I I, I, I I, buy that humans have a vague knowledge of the Sunwell, right? And someone like Nathanos, who lives very nearby for most humans and whose job clearly is to spy on the High Elves, might even know a bit more. Um, <laughs> it depends if they take a flight path or not. They can be there in minutes. <laughs> and also, yeah, he is, when he mentions the Sunwell, he is kind of fishing. You're right, you're, you're right. He is kind of fishing. But he does also know some specific stuff as well but I, I get that that's one of those things where if it is a change from the law and I think you could have a debate over whether it is even a change but if it is a change to the law I think it's one of those things that's just better so who cares we're going to carry on looking at some of these changes one of the things that is very very pronounced uh, in Sylvanas's journey and one of the things that they really focus on in Sylvanas's journey here and bear in mind this entire story like we say is not being told by a neutral narrator this entire story is being told by Sylvanas the holding form of this entire novel is that she is telling Anduin about her past we're not supposed to believe that she is saying word for word what we are reading but she is telling this story to Anduin in fact we're specifically told there are some bits of it that she's leaving out regardless of that it is all from Sylvanas's point of view and specifically being told for the purpose of trying to persuade Anduin that life and death is unfair and he should join them in trying to undo it. So there's a, a very heavy emphasis on the unfairness of Sylvanas's life, the unfair things that have happened to her and like her trauma from that. Even if there is more to her life than that, I think that's perfectly fair because she is telling this story for a reason and, and that comes across in the things that she decides to tell. So there's a whole ton of unfairness and a lot of that unfairness is, is focused around, obviously, Arthas and the way he treats her and that complete lack of control uh, and the, the incredible things, the like, disgusting things that he makes her do. Like the scene I was saying yesterday where she, as in Banshee form, basically just kills everyone in Silvermoon with her voice is horrible and brilliant and just really well done and just awesome. And when she eventually is able to shake off that domination, then there is, in her kind of forming of the of, of the Forsaken, it is framed very much, at least in the initial moment, she does it because she needs an army. And she does it because the one thing in that moment that she has escaped from the, the clutches of Arthas Menethil that she desires and that she needs is to kill Arthas Menethil. And to do that, he's in a big block of ice up in Northrend, She's going to need an army and no one wants to be in her army because she's a banshee. She's got her rangers 
who she's kind of like managed to kind of get back together, but that's not many people. And the humans don't want anything to do with her. She starts putting together the Forsaken and they are described in terms very much uh, in, in the opening kind of uh, exchanges as she wants them to be an army specifically, which I know like a lot of kind of Forsaken fans and I count myself as a Forsaken fan. I find like Forsaken one of the like most interesting races in the entire game and I love everything to do with them I think they're brilliant there's this thing where a lot of Forsaken fans and and, and Forsaken characters in game see Sylvanas as like this very caring person who cared about Forsaken because she saw so much of herself in them and they shared the same plight and she wanted to help them and create a society for them and be like their godmother and look after them protect them and, and stuff like that and there is elements of that that come in later but at the very beginning they are very much portrayed as being put together because she needs a fucking army and that's why she's doing it. So that might be a slight change to, to some people. I think that's a little bit un unreliable narrator. Sylv Sylvanas is very much in a place where she needs to distance herself emotionally for Forsaken. She's shown several times in the book uh, to kind of talk herself into seeing people she cares about as tools. That's a really good uh, point, Rumor. It's what I was going to move on to next. So yeah, you've got to remember it's Sylvanas telling us this as well. Sylvanas saying, like, I needed an army. And that's why uh, the, the, it's, it's told in the third person. So it's like Sylvanas did this, Sylvanas did that. But it is a story being told by Sylvanas, right? And she is telling it from the current time, from from like the holding form, where her relationship with the with the Forsaken is over. You know, like if you ask me uh, what I think of a certain girlfriend now, a certain ex girlfriend now, my answer is going to be quite different from if you had asked me when we were going out. You know, it was the same relationship. The relationship's exactly the same that I'm talking about. But if you ask me now with the hindsight of everything that's changed, my answer is going to be very different. Like if you ask me at the time, I'd be like, I love them so much. I'm probably going to marry them. Like they're like no one else I've ever met before. Now I'd be like, ah, oh, they were all right. Nothing about the relationship has changed. It's set in stone. It happened. Like it's in the past. Nothing could ever change about it. But the way I see the things that happened and motivations behind things that happened has changed with hindsight. And so in terms of it being a story being told by Sylvanas, I think that's something you can take into account as well, honestly. When she's talking about the Forsaken in certain terms, it might be completely truthful and real. It's truthful to her, whatever. It could be like, it could be a slight re-evaluation of things even kind of uh, subconsciously over time as well. Can you please tell me why the Alliance rejects the Forsaken? Is Varian did not even see the for Forsaken sent by Sylvanas, especially the Stormwind guard Saras Colton, who was a sister in Stormwind? So, I think uh, the whole like um, Alliance rejecting the uh, Forsaken is something that was in lore anyway. Obviously, it's the whole, it's literally why they're called the Forsaken. But there's a scene in the book where her first, because obviously her first port of call for, you know, a faction to join as the Forsaken is the Alliance. It makes perfect sense. All the all the Forsaken are humans from Lordaeron. All of the, all of her and her rangers are high elves who had allied with the Alliance before against the Horde specifically. So it makes perfect sense. And she picks out her four most human looking forsaken like the least rotten ones uh they're quite important in terms of like human society as well there's like a general and stuff like that uh, and she sends them to stormwind to try and open talks and they are never seen off again the implication is they're just murdered before they even get to the gates and i buy that <laughs> Like, the humans have just fought a huge war against the Scourge and the, and the Lich King, where they have seen friends and family, entire cities, turn into undead, mindless monsters. They don't know that the Forsaken are a thing. I think it's, like, perfectly reasonable to assume that literally anything that was undead that approached the gates of Stormwind would be shot. It's kind of a terrible, terrible plan from Sylvanas. I get that she doesn't really have anything else she can do, but I, I absolutely believe that, obviously, the guards are on orders just to shoot any fucking undead, right? Because as far as humans are concerned, only Scourge exists anyway. 
as far as when it comes to undead. Yeah, we're not told how it happens. They just don't hear anything and then find uh, the locket of one of them later. It's assumed they didn't get even as far as Stormwind. Um, never mind Nornians with Varian. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. Well, uh, Sylvana says she thinks they were probably just killed by, by guards before they got anywhere near Stormwind. So even though it wasn't Varian, Varian would have never even seen them or heard of them, but they were acting on Varian's orders and therefore, to all intents and purposes, Varian killed them, right? In the same way that you say Winston Churchill didn't go around snatching bread out of people's hands in India, but he caused a famine. Uh, honestly, should have sent a letter first. Yeah, yeah, something like that, right? Something that didn't put like your your most human-looking forsaken in harm's way. Exactly. I I, I agree with that. Bad plan from uh, from Sylvanas, but you know she's only just raised herself and she's uh, she's in a funny place mentally. So I I. Uh I'd buy it. My theory uh, that Helia was already working with the Jailer during Legion and that the Soul Cage comes from the Moor. Okay, so another uh, kind of change could be seen as a bit of a change is just before she even throws herself off Ice Crown at all. She's up Ice Crown. She's doing the whole Edge of Night thing of, uh, oh, duh, can't believe Arthas was killed and it wasn't me that did it. Boo. Oh, no, no, no. Let's actually, let's address the Wrathgate. Let's address the Wrathgate because we finally got an answer on this because people have been talking about the Wrathgate for a while now, ever since Alex Afrasiabi's, frankly, fucking crazy ass interview where... In hindsight, we now know Alex, Alex Frasiabi was completely off the rails at this point. Um, if the reports in the California case are anything to go by, he was often drinking at work and things like that. So I don't know if that had a part to do with it. Now, look, there's a lot about Alex Frasiabi that is Afrasiabi's Afras fault and a lot of reasons why Afrasiabi is a piece of shit and needs to be treated like a piece of shit and needs to be judged as a piece of shit. However, having a drinking problem is not one of them. It is not someone's fault if they've got a drinking problem. And the the whole like bro culture at Blizz was actually incredibly harmful to Afrasiabi in that case because what it did was it allowed and facilitated and protected that drink problem because they were all such fucking bros together instead of actually getting the dude the fucking help he needed, right? That doesn't excuse any of the shit shit stuff he did. It doesn't excuse him being a piece of shit to women and things like that, but it's fair to kind of assume that his drinking problem affected his work. I think you can definitely see that in some of his interviews in hindsight. That is one Florian Alex Frasiabi that I will not blame him for because that is not his fault. It's not your fault if you have a drink problem. Uh, you need, you know, it's a disease like anything else. Facts. Anyway, I just want to feel like it's important to clarify, right? Because uh, we judge people who have drinking problems uh, unfairly a lot of the time. Lots that we do deserve to judge uh, Afrasiabi harshly for, but that's not one of them. But maybe it had uh, something to do with the way he was completely fucking nutso in a lot of interviews. And I, I think that's definitely one of them, right? And it was a magazine interview. But, you know, you remember. You remember him at BlizzCon when he talked about the whole fucking cannon being fired and stuff. He was, and like, clearly none of the other team. That was clearly, like, literally off the cuff. I mean, it was played as being off the cuff as well right he's just making shit up and i think sylvanas doing the wrathgate was one of those things it came out in an interview and uh he said you know like we're learning lots about sylvanas like what she did at wrathgate making the wrathgate happen and stuff like that and a little offhand comment like that set world of warcraft speculation and and kind of like law communities alight. I did a video where I was like, doesn't necessarily have to be a retcon. You know, we don't know much about what happened there, but I'm so fucking glad that it isn't canon. And like very soon after that video came out, the position that I took was that like, I don't think we should really take even the guy in, in charge of the law. It was clearly an offhand comment. I'm willing to believe that he just misspoke because I don't think he meant to say it. Um, now with a bit of hindsight, I'm willing to believe he did mean to say it, but he was just fucking on one. <laughs> what was was notable was that it hadn't been touched on in-game at all. And as time went on, it was becoming clearer and clearer that uh, the the people that make the game were distancing themselves from that statement. And less and less likely that it was going to turn out that Sylvanas did Wrathgate, right? And this book would seem to confirm, and remember, it's Sylvanas telling this story, but this book would seem to confirm that no, she didn't. 
and that it was Putris uh, and uh, Varimathras doing it to try and overthrow her much as it's portrayed in game and it's actually a really really good bit of the book when it happens as well like it's a, it's a really exciting um, and uh, fun part of the book was Afrasiabi, uh, Afrasiabi the guy that supposedly fucked up the law on purpose I don't think that's an accurate way of putting it but there's no doubt you know let's take our emotions out of it for a second Sylvanas's current direction that she took in BFA was definitely his idea he was in charge of the story in many ways he was more important than Ian Hazacostas like he was certainly more protected than Ian Hazacostas Ian Hazacostas would not have had the power to fire him like you know he was higher up in the company than Ian and to all intents and purposes he decided what happened in the story that would have been like 100% true whatever as it happens there are multiple accounts from people that work at Blizzard off the record that I've had with people and that I've heard from other people that have had the same where they have all said yeah Alex basically pushed that through didn't hear like any opinions on it uh, it's what he decided he wanted to do his thing was like you treat every expansion like it's the last expansion so you you do something big and you don't think about like the the ramifications of that in the future uh, he seems like the guy they're blaming all their narrative things on no 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 uh, blaming specific and uh, not even blaming like maybe you love the direction of Sylvanas and stuff but there's no doubt like it's a objectively true that he was in charge of law when it happened and that he would have decided it right and if the buck stops with Denuza now which I believe it does then it certainly stopped with him then simple as that he by all accounts was a much more personality driven kind of law guy than Denuza and, and and did things his own way more than anything and I've heard from people off the record people who I know who they are obviously and I can identify them they had no choice in it basically there was no discussion it's what he decided was going to happen so whatever man that's how he ran his department that that's what he decided to do. Um, and that shaped, obviously, the entirety of the BFA arc. You know, don't forget when, when this story was decided on, blame Denuza for stuff that Denuza's done by all means. I don't give a shit. But the fact is, Denuza was a quest designer at that point. <laughs> Whatever meetings may or may not have been held about this, Denuza wasn't even fucking in them, right? Um, so it's not a case of, like, trying to throw someone under the bus or trying to blame someone for all the ills of the game. It's about identifying a timeline of when the thing that we're talking about happened, which I think is pretty fair and interesting, right? What are you going to do? Just go, oh, well, I guess we'll never know who was in charge of story when this was decided. Na 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 na. Wouldn't want to try and blame everything on someone who isn't there anymore. Nah, we'll never know. Yeah, we can know. And it's interesting to know. This would have all happened getting ready for BFA. And obviously it was carried through throughout BFA. At some point, Afrasiabi left the WoW team because he was moved off of the WoW team. Then you've got, you know, this thing where Alex Frasiabi has set a lot of balls rolling, not least of all with Sylvanas, one of the most important characters in the franchise. Got this story to tell, but he's also said a lot of other things like the Wrathgate thing. And this book would seem to suggest they did not go the direction that Alex Frasiabi suggested with the Wrathgate, put it that way. And it's, it's much more like how we knew the law as it was. Well, and I think that was becoming quite clear uh, over the years as they went by and that shit was never mentioned in game. And I would say that's the right decision, honestly. Then you get to the edge of night itself and uh, there is a moment in the book where uh, Sylvanas is at the top of Ice Crown Citadel and, you know, she's, she's contemplating the fact that Arthas is gone and it wasn't her that did it. And, you know, getting to the point where we know she's going to throw herself off the top of Ice Crown. Now in the book... The Valkyr are circling and talking and there's the merest suggestion that they might be slightly goading her into killing herself, um, which I didn't really, it's, it's so, it's such a light suggestion that I barely even registered it when I read the book. People have mentioned it since and they're right. But when I was reading it, it's such a mild suggestion that I'm not even sure how important it is. Yeah, exactly. A lot of people will be in this chat who completely missed it if they've read the book as well, I'm sure. But the important thing is she does it. And that's the moment where we knew since the Jailer was introduced that that's where she meets the Jailer. None of this has ever been in game. <laughs> None of it ever was. Uh, and this bit isn't either. Um, so she meets the Jailer. And the Jailer is fucking awesome in this book. I've said, I mean, the Jailer is shit, okay? Jailer's a shit baddie. He's shit in game. 
he's just shit the final raid cinematic that he's in the death of the jailer is the best he's been in the game and he's still shit he's generally very good in this book he doesn't do anything like he's chained up his arms are out the whole time he has like two whole conversations of like half a page each with sylvanas throughout the entire book but that's all it needs because just any explanation about anything is such fucking sweet sweet nectar that it feels great and just because he's not saying like pitiful mortals and shit like that and we know that this conversation happened we know that we know essentially what he said to her we know that he told her that he wanted to, to destroy the cycle of life and death because it was very unfair you don't learn anything from this scene in terms of what happened but it's still fucking lovely to hear it and it's still fucking really nice to just read it and would the game have benefited greatly from a this book coming out before the game or b having a representation of this conversation in the game? Yes, 100%. Absolutely would have done. Is the criticism you can't understand the story of Shadowlands without reading the book correct? No. And like both of those things can be true at the same time, right? In an ideal world, honestly, the book minus its ending would have come out before the expansion in much the same way that the Illidan book came out before Legion in much the same way as before the storm came out before uh, BFA. I know Shadows Rising was the book that came out before this expansion but why not both eh? Yeah or it could have been represented by a cinematic absolutely it would have made a brilliant cinematic. Now it's interesting isn't it because you should be able to say that and that just be its own point but unfortunately the the discourse has been so poisoned by people saying shit that isn't true that i have i have to say that because it's how i feel but i also have to address the 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 discourse which says that this book explains the story that you wouldn't understand if you didn't read the book because that's not true you know like i knew what had happened in the conversation between sylvanas and the jailer because Sylvanas tells us in the cinematics with Anduin, right? She says, I want to dismantle the machinery of life and death. It's incredibly unfair. The Jailer's going to do that, so I'm helping. And that's literally all that happens. The Jailer is like, hey, hands up, man. I want to overthrow the machinery of life and death. The Shadowlands is fucked. That sword that killed you, that Arthas was using, it was made by the same person that put me in this jail. Dude's not fucking lying. That sword... It was made by the Primus. That motherfucker put me in this jail. Just saying. And just when you think he's going to be really tricksy about it, he's like, but in fairness, the Primus did do it because I made him. <laughs> so you think he's being really tricksy about it, but he's actually double bluffing. He's like, yeah, it was made by the Primus who put me here because I made him. Hands up, man. I'm going to tell you the truth here. In fairness, it's because I made him do it. And obviously, Sylvanas is like, the fuck? Well, why would I Why would I team up with you then? This is ridiculous. Like, you're literally the reason for all my troubles. A another thing we were talking about with Deacons uh, a, a few streams ago. And he's like, yeah. Yeah, it's fucked up, isn't it, man? It's because I'm willing to do anything it takes to completely undo all this unfairness. And yeah, I'm like, a, a lot of people are going to be killed. And a lot of people are going to the moor. And it's really fucking unfair. But think about it. When I win, all of those people who got killed, they're not killed anymore because there's no more life and death. When I win, all of those people, they're, they're alive again and they're, they, like, they're much happier in a much more fair universe. Just saying. And like also, Arthas just did his own fucking thing, man. And it's very, very obvious in this book, in the way that Arthas is portrayed, that he's not dominated and that he's doing his own thing the jailer actually makes like a big a big thing out of not dominating people if he doesn't need to you know and, and sylvanas actually brings up she says well why don't you just dominate me then and he's like do i need to i don't think i do i think we want the same thing i think that fits with the arthas novel as well and with warcraft 3 i think if they suddenly made arthas dominated i think that would actually be a retcon because i don't think he's portrayed like that in warcraft 3 and i don't think he's portrayed like that in wow and i don't think he's uh, uh, i don't think he's portrayed like that in in the arthas novel either he's a bit of he's a bit of a shitbag let's be real the guy that did all the genocide and stuff he's quite bad and certainly when it came to raising sylvanas um and i always took that as him just doing his own thing right 
and being and even when we knew the jailer was on the scene in some in some degree even looking back at warcraft 3 that's clearly arthas doing that out of spite like if you've ever played the, the quests in warcraft 3 you see arthas getting progressively more annoyed and more angry with the way that sylvanas keeps foiling him and then running away and like he gets more, he takes it more and more personally until when he finally captures her and kills her like it is pure spite the reason he brings her back as a banshee and that's always been the way it was so i think it would be a much bigger retcon to have him or oh, that was actually the, the jailer doing that no 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 and and like it's you can see it in other people the jailer works with he doesn't dominate them he dominates anduin but there's no chance anduin would ever join him willingly and he needs anduin for something so it's it's been really interesting and, and part of reading the book was it was great to get all of these insights and you know they talk about argus and we'll, we'll go over all of these individually right but they talk about argus and they talk about the conversation with uh the jailer and sylvanas and they talk about sylvanas's journey through bfa and all the things she does in bfa and in in shadowlands as well and it's really it's nice to have that texture and that context and the story is better for knowing it the things that happened and the reasons they happened we knew and reading the story and reading the scenes and seeing the scenes absolutely makes the story better but you didn't need it to understand the story and i only because so many people have been saying this recently is why i'm even bringing it up and and so it's not like some weird crusade i'm on it's important to point out that this is a book that you don't need to read to understand why the things that have happened happened and how they happened because literally everything that happens in this book are conversations that we've had on on this very stream with me sitting in this chair in terms of Sylvanas' journey through BFA and with the Jailer in, in Shadowlands and it's all stuff that we've said and people are like well, what's your source for that and we've said the game and and it, it, it's proved true it's proved true would the game be much better if this book had come out before yes would it have been much better if some of these scenes that are in the book were represented in game rather than just like the plot points, you know, brought up and talked about? Yes. Do you need to read this book to understand the story? No. Simple as that. And I think that's important to say, unfortunately, because I should be able to sit here and go, man, it'd have been so much better if this book had come out before the game. And it'd have been so much better if some of this stuff had been in the game. And that should be it. I shouldn't have to talk about, oh, you, you still understand it though, without reading the book i shouldn't even have to mention that but because so much of the discourse is dishonest <laughs> it's like worst case dishonest best case like wrong and there's such a strong part of the discourse at the moment which is saying that this book explains things that you didn't understand otherwise i i, I have to i have to address that unfortunately and i i have to say that that's not true because it's not in my opinion um, so, in the course of the conversation with the Jailer, which I think is really, really interesting, and I think it's a really well-written conversation, and it's really fun, and I like it, and it's one of my favourite parts of the book, honestly, the Jailer is really clever. And I would also say that in the direct aftermath of this conversation is the most interesting thing that I didn't know that gets explained, which I, I can't wait to talk about. But I think the Jailer... Is one of the, the reason the jailer is so good in this scene is because he just doesn't fucking push it because he knows he's got her. You know, he selects his targets very, very specifically. And I've like we've been saying this all the time as well. It's like he doesn't need to dominate the people he works with because he works with people that are already on his side and already want the exact same things. Like Sylvanas, yeah, no shit, she wants to break the cycle of life and death. No shit, and especially you can appreciate that. Uh, when you've been going through like the heartbreak of her childhood and uh, you know days as a ranger general and, and and experience with Arthas and stuff like that, he works with Helia. No shit, she wants to work with him. Yeah, like someone who's been absolutely dicked by the cycle of life and death and domination, different type of domination. No shit, uh, Muatzala wants to work with him. Yeah, no fucking shit. Like. It makes perfect sense that all of these people work with him. He clearly selects his allies incredibly carefully. He knows he's got Sylvanas already. That's the thing. So he doesn't really need to try. And Sylvanas is like, I, I, I can't trust you. I will never believe you. I'm not going to be your fucking servant and shit, right? Do you think the Jailer, having once been the Arbiter, is still able to see the lives of people in an instant? So 
one thing that I'm right, I'm writing the weekly reset at the moment, which is like an end of Shadowlands special. And there's a line in it or a sentiment in it, which I haven't worked out how to word properly yet, which I'm quite proud of and which I think sums it up quite well. Because again, there's that thing of like, you know, another part of the discourse at the moment, quite rightly, is the jailer had a point. The jailer does got a point. The Shadowlands is massively flawed and unfair. And the cycle of life and death is massively flawed and unfair. Anduin says as much in this book, but it's that old kind of thing of the baddies got a point, but their methods are very wrong. You know, it's like, oh, these guys in Falcon and the Winter Soldier who are against like treating uh, refugees badly, they've got a really good point. Oh, they've blown up a building with loads of people in it. Ah, fuck. Uh, Well, they'll have to be stopped then, won't they? Oh, wow, this guy in Korra who uh, wants people who don't have, like, elemental powers to to have equal rights? Dude's got a motherfucking point. Oh, he's killed a bunch of people. Ah, shit. Okay, well, uh... Well, I was kind of on his side for a little bit there, but yeah, I can't be doing that, dude. You can't be doing that. And like, that's that's like a, a pretty standard trope, right? The baddie who uh, has got a really fucking valid point, but it turns out they're a psycho and they just kill everyone. So it's like, well, nice idea, but we're gonna have to shoot you and maintain the status quo now. Sorry, <laughs> you know? And that's absolutely what Shadowlands is doing as well. It's what fucking Shadowbringers does as well, by the way. (laughs) Like, you know, there's a reason everyone fucking relates to Emmett Selk is because dude's got a very fucking relatable problem, but his methods are not okay. The fact is we've changed a lot of stuff in the Shadowlands anyway, in fundamental ways that the Jailer would approve of and that the Jailer wasn't able to. And what's the difference between us and the Jailer is our methods. We have changed the Shadowlands, and the way we did it was we helped everyone that we came into contact with, and these changes happened. The Jailer is like a lone wolf. He doesn't trust anyone. He thinks he's the only adult in the room. The Jailer has tried to force change by hurting people and by doing his own thing, and he failed. We have succeeded in enacting change because we did it by helping people. And like, that's the difference. So this idea that, yeah, Jailer had a point, but it's not even that his methods were bad. It's that his methods didn't work. The Jailer, his methods weren't just evil. They literally did not succeed in changing the Shadowlands. Like our methods did. The game absolutely acknowledges that the Jailer's got a point. And that is shown in the way that we change the Shadowlands for the better in our time in it. And that's one of the things I actually quite like about the Shadowlands story is that there is a change in the status quo. You know, things do change for the better, like stuff that has always been and that it felt like we were there to protect at the beginning we have actually changed and we've made better and we've put better people in charge who have like fundamentally just changed the entire philosophy of the of the thing wonder why the story team went for that as a theme probably just a coincidence anyway um so what the jailer does is uh that was a bit of a tangent sorry is he goes well look I get that you won't be able to trust me and that's fine so here's the thing my Valkyrie are going to show you around and they'll take you anywhere and they'll show you anyone that you like and that's what she does and she in the book it's described as her losing track of time uh because she goes everywhere and she sees as much as she possibly can of the shadowlands and it's described she goes to revendreth one of the places she goes and and, a this is brilliant because it's another part of the shadowlands that we get to see like we were promised (laughs) before Shadowlands and it never happened. And this is where the meme of the lava eels comes from, okay? She goes to this lava zone and it's just lava. It's like inhospitable, but she's not real. She's like a ghost, right? And so are the Valkyrie. They're not there physically. It's like It's a Wonderful Life or A Christmas Carol. They're just kind of shades. They're there in essence, just observing, right? And living in this lava are eels. Me explaining it is gonna take longer than it is in the book. Just, you know, this is like a paragraph in the book, right? It's like hell because there's lava everywhere, right? And these eels are all writhing around in the lava. And she's like, shit, this must be another one of those bad zones, right? And the Valkyr is like, no, this is actually like a real, this is like a paradise uh, for these eels, man. Because, you know, 
Shadowlands is for everyone. It's infinite. She says, this is really interesting. She says that new, like, zones in the Shadowlands appear as quickly as the Arbiter judges souls. There's this suggestion that the Arbiter doesn't just judge the souls, but that the Arbiter can actually bring into being zones for specific souls, which is kind of cool, especially if it means that Zoval actually came up with the more in the first place. I don't think Pelagos would ever have come up with the more. Put it that way. For these eels, lava's amazing. They fucking love it. They have an amazing time. Look at them all wiggly. They're brilliant. And she's like, oh, so this this uh, this eel was really good in life. And she's like, uh, yeah, yeah. She uh, she ate her husband. She loved her husband so much, and that was like a uh, a sign of like love in in their planet and in their culture, right? And she's like, wow. So and 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 you know, she was so full of love. She lived a good life. This eel. So now she's in like eel heaven. She's in the fucking fire. And Savannah says like, and what about her husband? And Valkyrie's like, oh, I know. And Sylvanas is like, well, how can it be paradise if she's not with her husband? And Valkyrie's like, people aren't ever with their husbands. And she's like, well, have you ever seen a family be together in the Shadowlands? And the Valkyrie's like, look, I'm not saying it can't happen, but in my experience, I've never seen it. And the way people are talking about it online and on Twitter and stuff makes it sound so fucking random. But you've got to remember that, like, literally everything that Sylvanas has talked about up until this stage has been how important it is, you know, that her family is intact and the importance of uh, her brother to her and how she was looking forward to hopefully seeing him again in the afterlife and being with him again. And I guess it's kind of funny that it's an eel, but I mean, I don't find it that funny. I've got to be honest. If I'm really honest, like the thing that it reminded me most of was a book called The Buried Giant. If you've never read The Buried Giant, please read The Buried Giant. It's like one of the best fantasy novels I've ever read in my entire life. It's like literally one of my favorite books. Um, and like a big theme of that book, I don't want to, it's almost impossible for me to tell you what it's about. But a big theme in the book is love and whether love is real and true and whether people who love each other really should be together or deserve to be together in the way that they think they do. Um, and it's in this amazing like Arthurian uh, Britain. Um, and uh, it's about, it's about uh, cultures massacring each other. And it's about uh, buried as in under the ground, yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's like a phenomenal book. I think about it all the time. It's an incredible book. Don't you find it's a bit weird to hinge Sylvanas' attachment to family on a giant eel versus the themes of sisterhood she had pre-established uh, before, like on principle? It's not like there's a lack of any of that in the book, though, uh, Lollipop Hustler. That's the thing. Like, yeah, if the book was just about eels, if the book had only ever shown us eels in relation to family yeah that would be a bit weird but you're talking about one paragraph in a chapter where she goes to like loads of different afterlives and the thing that she gets from all of these different afterlives is that it's not fair in the way she wants it to be fair you know it's got its own rules and what the arbiter sees as fair might not be what you see as fair and the priorities of the Arbiter in what a soul deserves doesn't match up with what Sylvanus prioritizes. So yeah, the eel is just a different representation of a thing which is talked about pretty relentlessly and represented pretty rel relentlessly throughout the book. So it's just another way of showing it. And it's a way of showing that like literally this thing affects all forms of life. So I can totally see why they went with it. This alien thing which did ate its fucking husband which is why she thinks it's being punished in this lava and it's like no this is meant to be paradise and she's like well how can it be paradise without your family and that is again something which is ex another one of the jailer's points which is explored in game one of the questions players come out of this game thinking a lot is like why does draca not talk about her like why is she unconcerned with finding 
her family and why is this character unconcerned with finding their family it's like because you just don't and it is really weird to us as mortals and it doesn't seem good it does seem really unfair and that's something that players have been saying throughout the game and that's what this book is saying as well it's one of the things that sylvanus really convinces her that the afterlife is shit and that it needs changing so life is shit the afterlife is shit but she's still not ready to join the jailer and this is the bit this is the one thing in the book that is something that i didn't like no happened right and it's not important but it, it's kind of interesting and kind of cool yeah the, the love topic got brought up in bastion uh but it wasn't even that it was so mo grain starts talking about his family in bastion but it's not even because he's really talking about his family he's like i should be in bastion <laughs> why, why am i in why am i in maldraxxus like they go well if you were in bastion you wouldn't remember your family and you dr derive so much strength from your family and the memories of your family. It's like one of your driving forces. And it gives you so much strength that if you didn't have those memories, you wouldn't be as strong and you wouldn't be the person you are. Like the people that are in Bastion, losing their memories supposedly makes them stronger. That's not you. So he's not even really talking about his family. Yeah, it sounds like shit afterlife design. Sylvanas would agree with you. I would agree with you. Absolutely. And I think the game and the story agrees with you, importantly, as well. And that's I think that's kind of important to appreciate. Certainly, like, you know, it's portrayed in the book as meant... It's supposed to be a very persuasive argument, right? It's supposed to be something that you, the reader, can agree with. If there are many afterlives, shouldn't there be more than four Eternals? So, uh, there might be. But also... Um, just because there are infinite zones in the Shadowlands, it doesn't mean they all have to have, like, an important purpose. I, again, I've said this since the beginning of Shadowlands. Like, the ones that we see are very specifically the ones that have an important role, you know? So that's why we go to them. And that's why they have eternal ones in, 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 uh, in charge of them. But by definition, they can't all have important roles. Like, there's one which is just lava that eels can swim in no real purpose for that zone apart from to be nice for eels right there's gonna be a zone which is like just quite nice not amazing just like quite nice it's like you you deserve to go somewhere which is quite nice not amazing not horrible but quite nice and there'll be a load of souls that deserve according to the arbiter to go somewhere where it's just like one degree cooler than it really than is really comfortable perfectly nice place Perfectly nice, but just one degree cooler than you ever want it to be. Cornwall, yeah. The really interesting part of this story is that the jailer says, well, look, why don't you go back into the world of the living? Now, you know, you don't want anything to do with the afterlife. You go back and you let me know when you want to go, when you want to team up with me. And if you never want to team up with me, that's fine. But if you do, just tell one of my things, uh, Valkyr. And we'll, we'll get this thing kicked off, man. I've been waiting billions of years. I can wait a little bit longer. But before you go, here are some predictions. Uh, so you know I'm telling the truth. With your new insight, you will see injustice everywhere and fairness not at all. Watch for these five signs and know my words are true. A fiery darkness will return. You must step out of the shadows and lead. A blade will pierce the heart of the world and you shall hold the blood from the, the wound and sense its power. And finally, you shall topple a king and shatter the sky itself. So he was a big brain and not just talk, uh, taking chances. Well, this is what a lot of people are saying, right? And a lot of people are like, how can he know the future? This 5,000 IQ giga chad, holy shit. But yeah, uh, Sador Sadoran's got it. Sadoran's so got it. This is very much a self-fulfilling prophecy. And because we I I'm desperately trying to get Discord and Kitty to write some videos for us, or at least like, you know, plan some videos for us. And a subject that we've been talking about are these predictions that he makes. Because a lot of people fucking hate this. And Discordian and Kitty brought up a really good point. These aren't just like self like vague and self-fulfilling. They're actually the kind of predictions that a cult makes. Let's look at these. Let's look at these uh, predictions. A fiery darkness will return. Well, we know that's the Legion, right? But that could mean anything. 
if it was the old gods, you could say, oh, it meant the old gods. It could mean uh, a fire elemental. It could mean the the uh, the legion. It could mean the sky at night or Deathwing. Yeah, exactly. In fact, like when I first read this, I was like, dude, you're making this prediction too late. Deathwing's already arrived. That's an easy one, motherfucker. It could mean the Scarlet Crusade. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It could mean anything. It's it's vague enough to mean anything. You must step out of the shadows and lead. It's like. You must drink a cup of tea. You decide whether, like, you decide whether that prediction comes true or not, you know? Oh, I did drink a cup of tea. I decided to drink a cup of tea. Shit, the jailer was right! Like, it doesn't have to mean that she's in charge of the horde. It could mean anything. Again, it doesn't mean a single thing. Okay, so here's, here's the only one. A blade will pierce the heart of the world, and you shall hold the blood from that wound and sense its power. Now let's let's steel man this, and let's say he is specifically talking about Sargeras's sword. Where is the jailer at at this point? The jailer has had dreadlords feeding death magic to the soul of Argus for ten thousand years at this point. Um, it could, okay, I love that explanation, Butterbeans. It's one that I've got too. It could be the fact that time works differently in the Shadowlands and he just already knows these things. It could absolutely be that, right? The Arbiter is in like contact with basically every soul that dies, right? And sees their lives and sees everything that they've ever seen. So yeah, he knows shit when he was Arbiter anyway. But at this stage, he has been, he has had Dreadlords feeding death magic to the soul of Argus for, for, 10,000 years. He knows what might happen. To use the example I use uh, in in the video about the jailer, the system of picking the horses. Someone on your list is going to win five races in a row and then you get to the sixth race. If suddenly then I make a genuine prediction and I say, here's a prediction for you, this horse will win this sixth race and then you'll have won six races in a row. That's a prediction which is a lot more fucking educated. You know, once you've got to the stage where you only need one thing to happen, which is what he's doing here, that, or, you know, relatively, the prediction is much fucking easier to make. And it doesn't mean that it was all planned out like that from the very beginning. Just because he's in a position where he can see what's going to happen next because of the things that he's, he's done, it doesn't mean that that was the thing he thought was going to happen when he did the first thing right at the very start of that chain of events. Uh, but that's not his final prediction, that's in the middle. And finally, you shall topple a king and shatter the sky itself. Well, that's literally the plan that he wants Sylvanas to do for him. He, he just hasn't told her that yet. <laughs> like, that's not a prophecy. That's literally the plan. <laughs> that's literally the thing he's going to ask her to do. <laughs> like, for fuck's sake. Like, so that is, like, that is the, the thing with the planet, uh, with the blade and the blood is literally the only actual prophecy. None of the others are. Let's be really real. Uh, about that the only one that can even be classed as a prophecy or not even a prophecy because it's a plan right is a blade will pierce the heart of the world and you should uh, and yeah no shit that is a good shout not playing it down that is a really good fucking shout again we don't know what other irons the jailer has in the the like the 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 fire you know um and really importantly Sylvanas doesn't even need to get to the blade piercing the heart of the world before she joins the Jailer. So he didn't even need to get this one right. It's Warcraft. Who the fuck doesn't use a sword? Again, it could be explained as fucking anything if you needed it to. And for proof, just look at the way that we talk. Priests? Tell that to Anduin. All you motherfuckers saying priests as if we're not fucking progressing Anduin right now. Come on, dudes! Hunters, uh, fuck off. Hunters use every weapon, as well you know. That's the thing about predictions. People don't wait for the predictions to be fulfilled. They fit events to fit the predictions. And that's why these predictions are like a cult thing, because that's exactly what cults do. They make predictions that you can easily... It's what religion does, and it's what horoscopes do as well. They give you stuff which you can fit anything that happens to you into. I will grant you that the sword going into the world absolutely happened, but other stuff could have happened that we could have said was that as well. 
I'm willing to believe he is specifically predicting the Argus thing here, this plan that he's been working on for 10,000 years, and he can see where it's kind of heading at this point. But it could be, like, it could have been something else. Something else would have made fit. Like, again, we think a fiery darkness re will return is he's definitely talking about the Legion, but he, he, it could have been anything. Could have been fucking Ragnaros. Could have been the Iron Horde. You know, they used loads of fiery shit. Could have been lich. Could have been lava eels. Oh, shit. Wait, horoscopes aren't real? Yeah, of course horoscopes are, are real. They exist. People write them. It's just they're not magic. <laughs> So two of these fucking predictions are things that Sylvanas has to do herself. And it's it's like Macbeth, right? So I think, like, the power of these predictions... This will shock you, internet. But I think Twitter might have overreacted to these predictions a little bit. And unfortunately, when you do that, you miss the interesting thing about them. This is like the whole cosmology chart in the grimoire all over again, right? People were so busy shitting on that cosmology chart because it was different from the one in chronicle that they missed the interesting thing about it and i feel like that's kind of what people are doing here they are so willing to shit on it and clown on it i clown on shit all the time but there's actually a really interesting thing going on here which people a lot of people are missing because of it not in this chat in this chat you knew exactly what i was going to say before i said it um when i put it to you guys who had read the book you knew exactly what i was going to say but not, not all of the internet is like you. And what is interesting is that Sylvanas does not join with the Jailer. She then goes back and goes through Cataclysm and goes through Mists of Pandaria and goes through Warlords of Draenor. And the whole time she's had this experience, but she's not in contact with the Jailer and she is not serving the Jailer. But she's like, this whole time she's living her life and with this new purpose of like, the world is fucking unfair. Fuck all of this shit. And she's going through it and she's making herself, like she's putting herself in better positions. And she's like, just, it's why she undergoes this shit. Well, it, it is used to explain the change that she goes through from Cataclysm onwards of just being like, give a shit shit fuck all of this fuck you guys <laughs> which i think is kind of awesome and really interesting that she she because you know i think a lot of us assumed that she was serving the jailer from this point on and i think it was actually a really good decision uh narratively to say that no she wasn't she was still deciding you know she had the Valkyr there who were helping her out and she knew that any point she could start serving the jailer and what did she go through she went through a fiery darkness will return you could say she went through that with Deathwing. You could say she went through that with Ragnaros in the Firelands and the Firelands. You could say she went through that with the Iron Horde if you really wanted to. I'm sure you could find something in Mists that would explain it as well. And then the Legion, which is the bit we're all assuming he's talking about, but it's fucking vague. It could be anything. And that's the only one she actually goes through because then after the Broken Shore, when she is made war chief and one of the big things that people always said was a terrible retcon was like the way that sylvanas is clearly surprised when she is made war chief and she's surprised in the cinematic and she's surprised in shadow in uh in uh, uh before the storm as well she talks about how she's surprised that she was made war chief and people were like well why would she be surprised she knows it's part of the plan and it's really neat how they've done that to make it fit in the narrative. No, she's not even acting though, because she is like, oh shit, the jailer said that. And again, you will, must step out of the shadows and lead, could mean anything. We know that the jailer eventually was able to make her war chief, right? But he could have found some other way to fulfill that incredibly vague promise. And that's the bit. She becomes, uh, she becomes war chief and she's like, oh shit, man, the jailer was right. Fuck. Okay, yeah. Well, and the thing is, the jailer didn't need to be right. That's the important bit. The jailer didn't need to be right. She was already on his side. She just needed to convince herself. At that point, she had no idea Muzala was uh, whispering to Vol'jin. Yeah, exactly. She had no idea. Exactly. And the thing is, again, quite clearly in the book, it's portrayed that she doesn't like she's already on the jailer's side. And I think we've all been there. Right. Let's talk about something which is is a lot of unfortunately, a lot of people will be able to relate to in this chat, something which we can all agree is bad, but something that a lot of people will have done cheating on a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Right. You know, it's bad. There's no reason why you ever have to cheat 
on a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And we all know the the stages leading up to cheating on a girlfriend or a boyfriend, and they are always much earlier in the process than we like to admit. I saw a play once where a line that really resonated with me, um, where a guy is talking about when he cheated on his girlfriend, and he's talking to his girlfriend about it. And he's like, you know... I cheated on you when I took a phone call. Like, a week before I even cheated with you, uh, cheated on you, like, she phoned me. And I knew when I answered the phone, and by answering the phone, that's when I decided it was going to happen. That's when it happened. Um, and it didn't, like, actually happen till later. If he'd been called out for that moment, it's like, what well, the fuck are you answering your phone to that girl? He'd been like, what? I'm just answering my phone. Fuck. God. Stop being, like, so fucking clingy. And But, but like, he knows. And the girl on the phone knows. And if his girlfriend knew, she would know. But there's still, like, plausible deniability, right? Everyone gets to tell themselves that it's nothing. Um, and, you know, this is kind of what that is. It's like, she knows it's, like, this huge deal and that she shouldn't trust the jailer. But she she's been won over by his argument at this stage. And she needs the the... She needs the moment to convince herself. Uh, but the jailer needed to be right about the order of events why she joined him after literally the second one the only one which realistically is planned is step out of the shadows and lead but dude like if you've been told that you will step out of the shadows and lead that doesn't have to mean that you're going to become war chief like if i told you so there will be a moment in the next however many years where you will step out of the shadows and lead or not even will you must step out of the shadows and lead and like literally any time you do anything which could even be slightly fitting that description, you'll be like, shit, Tally was right. Oh my God. Yeah, that time when my manager didn't turn up and like someone needed to do the presentation and I did the presentation. Fuck. And of course I did. It was a PowerPoint. So it was dark in the room and I literally stepped out of the shadow and I did it. Fuck. It's the same way horoscopes work anything that can even slightly be, and if you want a proof that this is what humans do look at the way we talk about the nazoth whispers and how we we make anything that could possibly fit those whispers fit you know and we take great joy and glee in doing that i'm sorry for calling you dude if you're not a dude i know i'd like i can say that i meant it as a gender neutral thing and i did but that's not important because i know lots of people don't uh consider it so so i genuinely apologize for calling you dude yeah exactly we always and especially when we're in the situation where she's already been persuaded by her, his arguments and like is just looking for the spark like the reason to kind of convince herself you know if he was opportunistic then say so in game don't go full all of this was planned well the only person that's ever said it was all planned in game was him no one has said otherwise yeah dreadlord referred to the argus plan as the jailer's gambit there's the item in game which says that the jailer's like all the jailer needed was luck there's just as much evidence for it being opportunistic as being a big plan and by the way a big plan can still be opportunistic like again if there's one thing that i am begging begging the internet to understand if i'm if there's if i could if i if i could wake up tomorrow and make the un, the internet understand one thing it would be that two different things can be true at the same time a character can have like a motivation and also have a con conflicting motivation and they can both exist in that character like that character can say i would never cheat on my girlfriend and then cheat on their girlfriend like a, a character can be a good person and do a bad thing a character can do a, be a bad person and do a good thing a character can do an action that shows that they care about bread and then they can shit on some bread like two things can be true at the same time and I would even go as far as to say usually are. And likewise, a plan can be opportunistic in the way that I described it, because I, I wouldn't say that opportunistic is even the right word for it. You know, throwing lots of ideas at the wall and seeing what sticks can turn into a big, clever plan. All I'm saying is that you don't necessarily know the exact thing that's going to happen at the end when you start it. You know what you want to achieve, you know, and like, if I was like, I want someone to gift me a hundred subs, okay? There's lots of ways I could try and make that happen. I could 
start crying on stream and tell you a really sad story or I could tell you exactly what you want to hear I could tell you how shit wow is and you know I could try lots of different ways to get someone to give me a hundred gifted subs and someone might end up giving me a hundred gifted subs for one of those things so yeah I planned it you know the thing that I did to try and make someone give me a hundred gifted subs worked but I did try like 20 other things as well that didn't work. So I can sit there, I can go, ha ha ha, you fool. I planned for you to give me 100 gifted subs. That's why I told you the sad story. And they'd be like, oh, I gave you 100 gifted subs because uh, you, you told me that WoW was shit. Oh yes, well, I did that as well. So there you are. Every pawn that I put into place telling you how WoW was shit, all because I wanted you to give me 100 gifted subs. It's like, I'm not wrong. I did plan it, and the things that I did do did make the thing happen. But I did also do a lot of other things as well, because I, you know, I was hoping one of them was going to work. The evil jailer fears is the canon return of Madan. Yeah, I think we could all fear that, right? This is actually a genuinely very interesting part of the book, but not for the reason that people are shitting on it think. Um, and I hope that I've managed to show you why. Importantly, Sylvanas goes out, and I thought this was a really neat little touch. She doesn't join the Jailer straight away. She joins the Jailer properly when she becomes War Chief. She's seen enough, and that's when she joins up. And I, I felt that was I felt that was really interesting. So then you got this thing where we kind of blow through all the events of uh, BFA in, in super quick time, in like a few pages, because uh, the the child of blood that gets sent to her is Malganis. And is like, hey, cool, you're joining the jailer. Well, we're not quite ready for you yet. We got some shit that needs to go down. Uh, so, you know, it's good to have you on board. Welcome. You just do your thing. Like, just bear in mind that everyone that you kill is making the jailer more powerful, right? Like, that's what we need. We need lots of souls in the moor. So... You do what you do. Like, you kill people all the time. Just keep on doing that. Um, should uh, Sylvanas hate Marganis for uh, making Arthas the Lich King? Yes, and she does. Um, but also, she uh, she hates Arthas more than anything. So Arthas is her big motivation. She fucking hates Arthas. It's Arthas she blames for everything. And Arthas hated fucking Marganis. Like, Arthas hated Malganis. So, yeah, you're right that Sylvanas has a lot of reason to hate Malganis as well, but the fact is, the person that she hates most in her entire life hated Malganis. I'm not particularly excited about the Lord of the Rings show on Amazon. I think it's probably going to be shit. I'm, like, assuming it's going to be shit, right? I'm not very excited about it. And yet, so many people that I hate shit on it all the time. To the extent where I'm, like... Hmm, maybe it'll be quite good. <laughs> they hate it for the wrong reasons. I, well, I think I agree. I totally agree with you. But what I'm saying is, I will like the show out of spite. No, but I, I have like more interest in the show. Like, I didn't care if it was good or bad now, but now I kind of hope it's good. Just because people I hate, hate it unfairly and for the wrong reasons. It does affect how you see other things. Of course, like, you know, who else likes a thing, right? Like, likewise, when the whole, uh, that's exactly what spite is, no. No, 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 it's evaluating. Like, let's say I was transphobic, and, you know, maybe I thought I had really good reasons for being transphobic. Maybe I'd be like, you know, I, I just not sure about, just not sure about, like, you know, trans people in sport. I think there's, like, a conversation to have there and stuff, and yeah, uh, yeah, trans, uh, I think there's, uh, you know, and then suddenly I'd be like, oh, wait, all of the worst people on earth agree with me about trans people. Maybe I should, like, reconsider. Maybe I should, if not reconsider, just look at this a bit more carefully, uh, you know? I, I think I think that's a fair thing to do. I think it's good to see who agrees with you. <laughs> and if they're people that would usually worry you f to agree with you, like, just look at your thing again. You might come out the same the same side, but it's always good to, like, reevaluate, isn't it? Uh, the one thing I'll say about the book, most opinions I've seen seem to conflate their opinion of Golden as a writer versus the actual law being shown. Well, that would be the first time that's ever fucking happened, wouldn't it? Again, we don't really learn anything new about why the things that happen in BFA happen. One interesting... Okay, here's the thing we learn. We learn what the fucking lantern is. We learn what the fucking lantern is, and it's shit. <laughs> if, there's a, if there's a worst part of this book, it's the lantern bit. Because that was the one question I had, honestly, was like, the one thing I don't understand is what the deal with Helia was and what the fucking lantern is. And I've got to say... I ain't satisfied. <laughs>
The lantern is a uh, a cage of souls, and Sylvanus was literally just sent to go and get it from Helia, who was already working for the jailer. She was literally just sent to go and get it and give it to the jailer so all the souls inside the cage of souls could go to the mall. I don't know why Helia couldn't do it. I guess she was busy doing all the fighting at the time in the story. Uh, so yeah, do you know what? It's a bit shit in it. Have I misunderstood? I'm willing to accept I might have misunderstood that, but I did read it a few times. <laughs> yep, you got it wrong, Tally. I'm glad. Explain to me how I got it wrong. Okay, wasn't the plan to use the lantern to make Ear send the souls from the Halls of Valor to the moor? That would make a lot more sense. Okay, good. In that case, I've misread that bit. I was willing, I thought I must have done right, because it didn't make any sense. I still don't love it, I'll be honest. Okay, so the deal was, I see. Because Helia is stuck in Helheim, right? Ain't nothing she can do about that. So the deal, okay, this is great. This is interesting. It does make a lot more sense. Good. I'm glad that I was wrong, and I'm glad that you're here. How did the souls end up in Helheim? Uh, sorry, in the Halls of Valor. <laughs> Glad you asked. Um, so again, that's something we knew uh, and have known since uh, the beginning of WoW lore, really. Um, Odin uh, stops souls going to the Shadowlands uh, of his like mightiest warriors and shit and instead sends, keeps them in like a pocket dimension, right? And, and puts them in the Halls of Valor instead. Helheim is another such pocket dimension um, away from, from life but also away from the Shadowlands uh, one Sandy has also got a pocket dimension like that where he's been keeping troll souls instead of sending them to the Shadowlands where they will go to hell, uh, where they'll go to the moor like so um, one Sandy it, it turns out in the Ardenweald uh, Covenant campaign has been protecting troll souls from the moor by again keeping them in a little pocket dimension there's a lot more lore there but it's not relevant especially with Odin but we're not going to talk about all that now. And Elune technically does that with the Wisps as well, except they are in our reality. So it's not quite the same thing, but you're quite right, yeah. But Zul'jin did go to the Shadowlands. Yeah, but that's before the Arbiter was broken. It's not something one Sandy does as a matter of course. He started doing it because he worked out that all the souls were going to the moor. When Zul'jin was sent to the Shadowlands, that wasn't the case. Zul'jin went to Revendreth. When I put this on the internet, if I do upload this as a, its own video, I might just uh, cut the bit where I don't understand it out and make it look like I understood it all along. It just make a better video, but you'll know the truth. <laughs> oh, guys, so I don't know if you... I've, I've noticed online um, a lot of people... Uh, didn't understand what was going on with Helia or uh, Helia's lantern in the book. Um, basically, if you didn't understand it, you're a fucking idiot, but I'll explain it to you now because I know how to read and you don't. Um, the deal was, uh, it's explained really fucking obviously in the novel, so I don't know how you didn't get this. Uh, the deal was that uh, Sylvanas was going to use Helia's lantern to uh, control the Valkyr, uh, and uh, in return, she's going to send the Valkyr to Helia uh, so she could have them, which is nice. And also, she was then going to uh, uh, send all the souls from the Halls of Valor into the moor to help the Jailer. So... I can see a lot of people in the chat didn't understand that and I'm really glad that I explained it. Good. <laughs> so, I mean, that's basically what she does. She goes out and she starts the war and again, it does fit in with uh, Before the Storm because she's like, okay, her first plan is she's like, great, well, the Jailer's told me just to do whatever I want. Bear in mind, she, she knows there's no consequences now, you know? Not only does she know that eventually she's just going to be teaming up like properly with the jailer and just she's untouchable so she can do everything she's always wanted to do she can enact pain and hurt on anyone she's ever wanted to with zero consequences not just for her but for them because she can massacre people now on azeroth but it's all in favor of something which she believes is a greater good but not just a greater good they're not even really sacrifices because when she wins and when the jailer wins all of these people come back to life. Like, all of these people might get sent to the moor, but when she wins, the moor doesn't exist. The Shadowlands doesn't exist. Life doesn't exist. They're just one glorious whole, and they're all back together, and everything's great. So, like, she, you know, has no conscience about this, because these, these people she's killing, it's a bit like with Jesus, right? Please, allow me to explain. I'm talking about the lack of consequences, right? So something I've always... Look, look, look. look. I, I respect everyone's religion, okay? But I'm not religious. Um, and, and the thing I've... I, I always think there's a bit of a plot hole in the Bible. The thing where, like, I'm really glad that Jesus... 
sacrificed his life for my sins. I really appreciate that. But he did come back to life again three days later, which I've always thought does kind of undermine the sacrifice a little bit. I love you guys, all right? And, you know, especially people like 37 month subs, like I would die for you if I could come back to life three days later. Like I can safely say that if I thought it would help any of your lives in a meaningful way, let alone make sure you could go to heaven instead of hell, I would die for each and every one of you if I could come back to life three days later. Would you be tortured and nailed to a cross? I mean, we'd have to negotiate. Like I say, my opinion is based just on, on you know, it's not a serious critique of the, the of the Bible, right? It's just like, you know, I'm more saying like, there's not quite the sacrifice that we usually associate with someone giving their life for something, is what I'm saying. Like, you know, we say, oh, someone literally died saving someone. We go, fuck, that is like the ultimate sacrifice. Because I think it's fair to say that most of us are not assuming that that person then came back to life three days later. And our reaction to how big a sacrifice it is, is based very much on the fact that they probably didn't come back to life three days later and so there is like a, an assumed consequence there that that uh again uh, impacts how bad we think the thing is okay so f and, and the reason i'm bringing it up with sylvanas is she's killing all these people because it's helping her plan work but also because there is no consequence like these people are not going to suffer the consequences that we think they're going to suffer in Sylvanas's view. Because when she wins, everyone, including the people she's killing, are going to be better off. She's not, in her mind, she's not even sacrificing these people, you know? She's actually helping them. That's the thing. <laughs> Let's inflict a lot of pain and suffering for no reason. That's not helping, that's evil. I agree. I agree because of magic. I agree. But in her, like, I agree that Sylvanas is a baddie and was doing bad things. And that's what the story is telling you as well. But from her point of view and her motivation is that everything I'm doing is for the greater good here. And not oh, not the greater good just for the people that survive. The greater good for the people I'm killing as well. So if I have a little fun and revenge in the meantime, what difference does it make? Like, that's her motivation and her reasoning. And I agree with you. That is evil. Um, and is unforgivable but it's explaining her motivation and just because you can explain a motivation and just because it makes sense doesn't make it a defense that's another thing i wish the internet can understand i'm not saying that's what you're doing i'm just talking about the internet in general <laughs> if i was jesus and had to die for all your sins you'd be fucked look and i know there's a lot more to it in christianity about jesus dying and i'm not taking the piss out of it i'm i'm not religious but i i have no kind of bad feelings about people who are and and like i know there's a whole fuck ton more nuance to it than that and i know that there's a, a, a you know i know what i know what the 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 sacrifice is and involves and what it stands for and what it does um so please don't think that i'm just dismissing it but what I, I was using it as an example of implied consequence and in jesus's case there wasn't quite the consequence that we might imply in a normal situation and that's the same for for sylvanas as well i was a bit disappointed that they didn't mention nazoth and this goes back to what the uh, the earlier commentator said about a bit of a weird timeline thing and you know what it is a bit of a weird timeline thing and it's something that people have brought up online and i think it's uh I think it's worth bringing up. Uh, I think uh, Belila shared this one as well. There's a couple of different reasons why I'm uh, a bit disappointed with this one. Sylvanas turned to see the old soldier, Varrock Saurfang, standing in front of the gates of Ogrimmar. He looked so tiny from so far away, and yet his voice was strong. I challenge, he cried, Mokgora! There was no turning back now, so the awesome cinematic. A few hours later, Sylvanas walked in deep snow, icy wind tugging at her hair, and reflected on how this chapter of her existence had ended. So, it does certainly appear that they go straight from the Mokgora and a few, like she yeets off into the sky after zapping uh, Southang and a few hours later, she is in Northrend, Ice Crown specifically, in the snow, ready to enact the Shadowlands cinematic trailer. So Ashara and Nazoth are not mentioned in the novel at all. Now, there's a few reasons for this. For one, not everything that happens in BFA is mentioned. And I've got to, I say that I'm disappointed that Nazoth isn't mentioned in this book in terms of a WoW lore guy. As a reader of the book, I'm not disappointed 
he was men- he wasn't mentioned at all. Like those of you who have read the book, maybe you can maybe you can appreciate this. Maybe you agree with me. Let me know if you do or not. At this point in the book, you have had like bullet point after bullet point. Like it's it's very much like just hitting beats in the story at this point in the book. It's like oh, and this thing from BFA. Oh, she felt like this when she did it. And this thing from BFA. Oh, she's doing it this. And this thing is BFA and this and this and, and like it's it's like breakneck at this point. And it's very much just hitting markers. Honestly, it's not the best bit of the book. And it's very much just explaining shit that happened that doesn't really need explaining. But it's the story of Savannah. So you got it right. Uh, and so it's just like literally kind of listening events from BFA at this point and as a reader of the book I didn't need more stuff as a law guy I'm disappointed they didn't mention Nazoth as as a reader of a novel I'm not does that make sense Nazoth was never really part of her plan it's something that happened uh, which she was fine with like if you've done the loyalist ending um, then you've spoken to Sylvanas in between this line here in between these two sections, this is the this is the loyalist ending. This is your Sylvanas loyalist meeting up with Sylvanas at Windrunner Spire and her saying, among other things, uh, well, leave them to the fucking old god. He'll make lo- like the war ended a bit sooner than I would have hoped, uh, but fuck it. Nazoth is going to kill loads more people. It's fine. Like, you know, the jailer's going to get his dead. It's fine. If it doesn't make us understand Sylvanas more, what really was the point in this book? Let's, uh, I don't want to get into definitions of words, right? But is understanding the same as knowing? Empathizing? Understanding something isn't necessarily the same as feeling something. In my opinion, do you understand the story as much without reading the book? Yeah. In my opinion, is it better to read the book? Yeah. <laughs> Again, more than one thing can be true at the same time, right? But then I'm personally not against shit being in books. Also, other people might disagree with me. Like, you might think that, you know, there was something about the story that you didn't understand that you do from reading the book. And I feel that the proof is in two, almost two years worth of streams and videos. I feel like I knew what the story was. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like the book proves me right. <laughs> um, uh, Argus is another thing that is explained uh, in exactly the same way it's explained in the game. Again, something that turned out not to be Talies in headcanon after all. Uh, but also, Tanya, you have the benefit of tons of context, years of playing. Yeah. So here's the thing, right? I think it's an interesting conversation. Like, uh, do you need to uh, read the book to understand the game? I actually think one of my main criticisms of this book is the opposite. In that I think as a book taken on its own terms, because all the criticisms I've talked about so far, as a law guy, and as a guy who's interested in the law, and I'm talking about it purely in terms of its relationship to the game. If I'm talking about it as a book on its own terms and standing on its own feet, then my biggest criticism of it is that I don't think you're going to understand it if you don't play the game. In that, from the second she joins the Jailer and it goes into that really, like, quick fire, you know, you're going through the events of BFA and nothing's really explained in the context of BFA because they know you know and they know you just want to hear it and see it from her point of view to answer this thing and to show you this thing and to get to this next thing and to get into the current day and stuff like that. If you hadn't played the game and you didn't know stuff about the game and you didn't know like who, you know, like Arthur's not a great example because you do get him, but like other characters and stuff in it who would like zoom through and you know they're a bit important, but you wouldn't know who the fuck they are. If you don't play the game, I don't, and you, if you don't have a basic understanding of the story of the game in the last ex- couple of expansions, then there's huge swathes of this book that you wouldn't understand, uh, you know? If I'm if I'm critiquing a book by itself, then that would have to be a, a big criticism of it, really. But then how many people does that criticism really apply to, right? And that's important too. I don't know, my genuine final takeaway is that the story felt good up until the Jailer's inclusion. Um, Taking all of the previous narrative of a woman survivor and the obvious uh, allegories which were there uh, early on in her themes, which the book does expand on, and then uh, tying it down to a power-hungry man left me feeling... I don't don't think... If they tie her experience down to a power-hungry man in the book, which I think they do, I'd agree with you, but I disagree with you that that man is the Jailer. Like, they very much do tie a lot of her trauma and experience and main motivation for her in her undead life to a power-hungry man, yes. But that man ain't the jailer. Like, it's very explicitly 
tied to Arthas. Her hatred for Arthas burns so bright that literally informs everything she does from that point on. My general reading of the book is that she's always been brash and her levels of fucking around and finding out just keep escalating from when she fake poisoned the boys that are mean to her brother. Decoy Royson, that's really good. And one thing I really love that they establish in her... Uh, in her life before she even becomes ranger general is how she doubles down on being wrong there are bits in the book where she clearly recognizes she's wrong and she regrets being wrong but she chooses to double down because her feelings are hurt i really love how they do that she feels like she's treated unfairly at the same time as having far too much pressure put on her and so she doesn't take criticism very well. I know people like that. I just want to make one quick point, if I could. The book also explores Savannah's taking on allies that aren't her ideal or moral choice. Very good point, Skeleton Etiquette. The Horde killed her brother. She joins the Horde. The jailer is responsible for Arthas, but isn't Arthas. Uh, so it subtly explains her. I thought it was really clever. I can completely agree with you, Skeleton Etiquette. Yeah, I think that was another really nice thing. Something, something that no one fucking has a problem with, generally, in WoW lore, right? Uh, that she joins the Horde. Something that is explored, like, really in-depth in, in, in the book, for sure. Yeah, yeah, so, like, something that is explored really nicely, and you see her thought process for doing that, which later on feeds into and, explore, and, and informs her thought process for joining the Jailer. Absolutely. I also uh, think that the line where she's burning Teldrassil and her initial thoughts say, Arthas was right, was a bit, I don't know. Yeah! Uh, okay, I'm going to agree with you on that one. I didn't like that line either. I get what they were saying, and I agree with the sentiment of that line, but I think it was... Uh, I, yeah, I, I, I agree with the general opinion on that one, that it was clunky to the point of seeming out of place. Also, Delarin and the Night Elf Rangers are such a footnote in this book, which is weird. I just don't think the Night Elf Rangers are important to Sylvanas in any way. Pretty much everything in BFA is blown through because the important thing that the book wants to tell you is why she's doing any of it. And it's kind of the same answer for all of it, <laughs> you know? So they hit on things that happen in BFA, but they kind of don't need to. They kind of just need to tell you why BFA happens, which they do. Um, and yeah, it's kind of the same thing with Nazoth. Like, from a law point of view, it's one of the things that I'd like to have seen. But from a reading a book point of view, I'm really glad that they didn't hit literally every single thing. Um, you know? I think this is bad passage of time. Now, like, if I'm being charitable, which, I'll be honest, the book deserves, because it's fucking good. I'm inclined to be charitable towards this book because it's fucking good. Simple as that, right? There are lots of things about writing that Shakespeare is shit at. One of those things is any kind of structure. Like, they're quite important things as well. Like, Shakespeare is very bad at structuring a play. Shakespeare is very bad at remembering what characters exist in his play. He's very bad at geography. Now, do I forgive Shakespeare these things because Shakespeare is fucking great? Yes. Am I still allowed to clown on them? Yes. Does that clowning come from a place of love because really he's very good? Yes. Am I going to be generous towards, towards this book in a moment that I think is badly edited? Yes. I'm going to be generous towards it, but am I going to acknowledge that it is badly edited? Probably yes. Probably not great. For anyone that knows the game, this leaps out as such a weird time anomaly that you can't help but be taken out of it for a moment. Yeah, they could just remove a few hours later. I'm still not a fan of the I Will Never Serve moment. I kind of like it. And, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, people have been in this stream with kind of saying that she's dumb or it comes out of nowhere or there's no way she should have, would have ever kind of convinced herself that she was gonna, wasn't going to serve the jailer or whatever. And I've gone, I've said in the past, you know, I think it's quite believable that you can convince yourself to team up with someone that you know is bad for an objective that you think is worth it. I think we see that in real life and in other stories and stuff, like an awful lot. And, you know, so like, I think that comes through in the game. It certainly comes through in the book. Personally, I think it comes through in the game as well because I got it. And I appreciate that's different with everyone, right? But there isn't like a character motivation in this book that I feel I didn't get from the game. And I'm not just saying that. 
I've got the fucking receipts of years worth of videos of me explaining what I think those motivations and things are from what the game has given me, right? So I got it. So to some degree, that those things are definitely there. Now, are they there enough so that everyone gets it? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. Clearly, some people didn't get it, so you'd have to say not. Okay, serving for Sylvanas is very clearly an allegory to all the tra trauma she went through with, uh, with Arthas. So clear tie uh, to a deeper meaning. Yeah, I'm not sure I completely agree with that either, Lollipop Hustler, but I, I think it's all relevant. But I think it's even simpler than that as well, in that Sylvanas didn't think that the Jailer wanted to control everyone and make them serve him. I think she believed that he wanted the same things as her, which was to unmake life and death, which he does, but also for everyone to be equal in that, which he obviously doesn't. And I think it's as simple as that. Once once they are on the point of victory and, and he's like, everyone's going to serve me. Ha ha. She's like, oh no. Fuck. And it's that thing where, you know, you've, you've, you've convinced yourself that the means justify the end. So you've convinced yourself that one thing is true. But when it turns out not to be true, you're not surprised. Again, it's that thing of two things can be true at the same time. Like, you can convince yourself that this guy is telling the truth and that you're doing the right thing by following him. And you can not be surprised when he turns out to be lying. Like, those two things can be true at the same time. The one thing I wish people on the internet could understand. I, I, I'm not actually even really disagreeing with anything, but I think the simpler explanation is also true. Because um, then, like, basically, once it gets to Shadowlands, once it gets to her tearing the crown, uh, we, we, we pretty much, like, just go to the future. You know? We whiz through all the BFA stuff. We shit through all of the Shadowlands stuff. And we're basically at the end. Again, something you would not understand if you hadn't played the game. I think the fact that Sylvanas only decided uh, to agree to the Shadowlands plans after Vol'jin's death and only got more into herself after Shadowlands, Shadowlands begins makes things work a little better. Yeah, uh, that's um, like genuinely one of my favourite things in the book is the fact that she doesn't actually join the Jailer until the beginning of Legion. I think that's kind of cool. I, I, I really like that. She got all worked up thinking he's right, but then she gets there and it's like not what she expected, but she already committed to this. Yes, I, I, I completely agree with you, Kitty. Are there any more retcons and revelations that I should have touched on uh, that people who have read the book can think of or that people are talking about online? This is going to be a very, very fucking long video on the second channel, by the way. Okay, revelations. Lyrith is a bard. We knew he was very musical, right? I don't think that's new, but I, they've expanded on it more. Yeah, Lyrith is a great character, really good. Uh, and, and so, one, okay, they do kind of draw a link between Sylvanas' love and admiration for uh, Lyrith and his, like, literal physical and spiritual kind of uh, similarities to Anduin. You, most of us will spot that quite early on in the book, but it's made very explicit later on. Like, she literally just says it out loud. How, like, one of the reasons she's kind of drawn to Anduin is because he's a bit like Lirath. Not just because he's blonde, but because he's kind of out of place, in a way, amongst the war people like she's a ranger and she's grown up among fighting and like organized military fighting at that and so has anduin right he he sits at war tables and with generals and stuff like that but he's just got a different approach and it makes him a bit out of place in a way that might make him seem a bit weak oh okay the lament of the highborn stuff in the book yeah thank you thank you Fucking brilliant. Thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely amazing. They predictably bring up the bit where an adventurer brings her her pendant and she sings Lament of the Highborn. And in the book, it could be cheesy and terrible, but it's so good. It's like so... And she's really fucking rude to the adventurer like she is in the quest. And it's so great. And it's already been established that uh, Lament of the Highborn is a song that exists like in the canon. But also Lirath is like awesome at singing it. So it's like one of Lirath's like party pieces is that... And one of the reasons he gets discovered, right? By like famous uh, and powerful um, blood elves is that he's particularly good at singing fucking Lament of the Highborn. And... 
so it's it's a song that means something to high elves anyway it's like it's like a canon favorite right but also it has a very personal connection to uh sylvanas beyond just the amulet in that it's a huge connection to lirath and everything that she misses about him so great so fucking good oh i loved it so this is like the last line in the book right and you've probably seen this uh, going around as well. And again, she, like suddenly she's just in the moor. It's very obvious why they had to time this book to come out at least after the final chapter, the judgment chapter, because it wouldn't make sense to anyone otherwise. Uh, as it happens, if you haven't played the game to that point, you're not going to fucking understand this anyway. But anyway, so she's in the moor. She's just got there. She's got to clear out the moor of souls. It's going to take forever. Like, um... It's made very explicit in the book, something which I I said in, in the quest, but it is very explicit here. It's a it's an eternity sentence. It's not something that can ever be done. It's like telling everyone to pick up every grain of sand in the world. They can never do it. There's an understanding that she will never be done with this task. Uh, but before Savannah could again stride forward into the vastness of the moor, she heard a sound, one familiar and utterly unexpected. The distinctive clank of metal armour. Hope, Anduin had told her, is what you have when all other things have failed you. Where there is hope, you make room for healing, for all things that are possible and some that are not. Uh, it's obviously Anduin. Yeah, uh, when I when I read this uh, in isolation, when I saw it going around the internet, I was like, hey, it could be anyone. It could be Nathanos, it could be Uther. Uh, you know, it's definitely Anduin. Like, um, if, you, if you read the book leading up to this, there's no mistaking that it's Anduin. Like, the clank of the armor is very important. They were, like, just the general feel of it is just, it's, it's just, it's def. I can't really eloquate it. I can't really explain it. But if you've read the book, you think it's Anduin, right? And I think that's kind of cool because in the book, she is shown kind of convincing Anduin a little bit. Do you get the uh, impression they're shipping Anduin and Sylvanas? No, I, I actually don't, um, <laughs> Deacons. I don't. Uh, I think it's very much more, you know, each one has got something that the other one kind of needs, uh, which I think is quite interesting. The game ending cinematics and stay a while and listen also kind of shows that it's Anduin. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. If you've, if, you've, if you've played the game, I think it's even more obvious. Oh, yeah. And the whole book is about her denying hope and denying herself hope because, you know, she goes through enough pain anyway. Right. And she's always disappointed. And so, yeah, the, and obviously it's been a line that she has said throughout BFA and Shadowlands, like, uh, you know, we will destroy hope, etc. It's been a very relevant thing. And the idea that she finally lets hope back into her soul sort of thing. Uh, towards the end. Sylvanas Windrunner felt hope rise within her. For the first time in so very long, she invited it in. Sylvanas does a lot of denying herself things, right? It's strongest as a book in the first third, where it's going through her kind of childhood and history and stuff and just enjoying the characters lots. It's at its weakest uh, kind of just after the deal with the Jailer and blowing through all the BFA stuff. Um, and, and just like really kind of hitting timeline events and what have you. And I think it's got a really strong ending. I think it's fantastic. And, and I don't think it explains any plot points that we didn't know already. It adds texture to them and it adds background to them and depth of understanding, perhaps, uh, as, as Deacon said yesterday. I don't think it's fair to say that you need to read the book to understand the story of the game. In this case, will your enjoyment and understanding of the game be improved and heightened and deepened by reading the book? Yes. Do I personally think the game would have benefited from the book coming out before Shadowlands? Minus the ending? Yes. Uh, do I think they could have found a lot of this texture in the game as well as having in the book? Yes. But I still think you don't need to read the book to understand the game, which I really wish I didn't have to say and clarify, but it's something people say and talk about. It's a great book. You should read it. I'm always surprised by how good the WoW books are recently. I've got to admit that whenever I come to read one of these books, I'm always a bit like, oh, do I have to read the Warcraft book? Do I have to? And Before the Storm and Shadows Rising and this 
and Illidan, to a lesser degree, have been fucking bangers. I, I, like, I'm really impressed with this. I guess it probably took me about 11 hours to read, and it was time well spent. I will probably read it again just from my own pleasure. It's one of those books where I can I can give it to Evertel, and I can say genuinely, I think you're going to enjoy this. I feel like uh, some of the criticisms I've seen online have been a bit unfair and out of context and a bit caught up in their own glee uh, where they've missed some really genuinely interesting stuff. I think a great example of that is like the Jailer's kind of, we'll call them the Jailer's prophecies. I think a great example of that is like the Lava Eels, which I actually think is quite a good bit in the book. An interesting bit, since you bring up Denuza in, in the chat, Christy Golden in her thanks in the book at the end spends an unusually long time effusing about Denuza. She does, you know, she thanks everyone and does the team and stuff. And she spends like an unusually long time talking about how great Denuza is. I'm not her. I'm not Denuza. But make of that what you will. Thank you to everyone joining us for this mammoth picking a part of the book. I'm sure it's not the last thing we'll ever say on the book. Because uh, I'm probably going to read it again. And I'll probably have some different things to say about it. But thank you for uh, joining us on this journey. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Over two days. Um, and uh, I hope maybe you got some insights into it if you haven't read it and you don't want to read it and your plan is just to watch videos about it and stuff i honestly would recommend reading it just for the fucking lols like genuinely quite apart from any kind of warcraft lore or understanding the game or the world or anything better it's genuinely a cracking read and i enjoyed it just as an experience of reading a book and i would highly recommend it